Hey, what is going on, guys? Hope you're having a fantastic Sunday. Welcome to the AV Experience. Tonight, we've got an incredible show for you. We've got two really special guests. We've got Stacy Spears and Don Munsell. They're the, the authors of Spears and Munsell Calibration Discs. We're going to be talking about that. And also, at the end of this podcast, we will actually be giving away one of their discs as well as, just pop this up here. So it's a three disc set. And we're also giving away an LX1 bias lighting. And so you can get to choose uh, the length of that. So we've got that drawn already. So I already know the winner, but we'll announce that at the end of the podcast. So Stacy, Don, welcome in. Thanks for Thank having me. Thank you. Well, we are super excited. So we're going to talk all about Spears and Munsell. So if you guys have questions about video calibration, um, even there's some audio calibration stuff on there. Drop those questions in the chat. We'll try to get to those as many as we can. Um, if you've got a super chat, we'll give you priority and drop that up front. But definitely those are not required. So we're super excited to have you guys on the show tonight. I'll just say hi to some folks in the chat. Let me back up here. Miles, good to see you. Finster, as always, Chris. Who else we got here? Miles, oh yeah, SRW1000, good to see you, K-Man, Geotech, Neil, Pedro, Don, we got Josh, JD the Expert, Michael, Zombie, Frank, we're going to have a good show tonight. So like I said, drop your questions in the chat, and also let us know where you're watching from. I always like to see kind of what part of the country, because we've got folks here in the U.S., but also literally all around the world. And so let us know where you're joining in from. So Stacy, Don, give us a little bit of background, um, just kind of who you are. And uh, I think it'd actually be cool. Like, how did you guys even meet? Uh, I'll start. I We both worked for Microsoft um, uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I read an article, we were both into AV, and I read an article written by Stacy, where he was one of the writers, on uh, secrets of home theater and hi-fi. And something about the bio, something in the bio, I don't think it's said that he worked for Microsoft, but something about it made me think, I wonder if he works for Microsoft. So I checked his name in the employee directory or whatever, and I could send him an email. So I sent him an email and said, are you the Stacy Spears who just wrote this article? And I had a question, and he answered right away, and we ended up talking about AV and um, yeah, we, we just, we did some evaluations of, um, I think it was TVs or projectors or something like that. And then Stacy invited me to participate in a DVD player shootout. And, mm -hmm. you know, over time we just like, we found that we had a lot in common about, you know, like, um, uh, our attitude about video calibration and we both are big movie fans and um i don't know we have a different enough background we're both engineers but mm -hmm. you know like we have just enough differences that i think we complement each other pretty well as far as our talents and our interests and stuff like that so um yeah we've been collaborating on a variety of different things we did the sort of progressive dvd player shootout that was a huge thing that got us a lot of attention and that sort of led to other things and eventually led to making discs i guess that's the short version maybe that's nice. the short version well yeah you had emailed me and i think we met the next day or somewhere later in that week at magnolia not magnolia yeah magnolia hi-fi we both mm -hmm. basically went in with a stack of discs went, in, went <laughs> right? into one of their theater rooms closed the door and spent an hour in there going through the discs so wow. is this like a like a who's who has better discs environment? <laughs> well, Don had questions. Oh, I like your disc. Let me one up you, and here's one, and let me show you this one. And well, at the time, I had the Wickle disc. Don did oh. not have that one. Mm, that was the Windows true. Hardware Quality Labs with the yeah. first moving wedge, yeah, with a bunch of DNR leasing tests. Mm. But Don had had questions about progressive scan, so we went, and that's what really kicked off the progressive scan research, because it was after that Don's like, well, maybe I should write a tool to actually dump the flags on the disc so we could figure out on the discs, if the error is on the disc or if the error is in the content to sort of help reverse engineer what players were doing. You know, if Don you walked up to somebody and just went, hey, you want to see my Wickle? <laughs> that could get you into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, like both goodness. of us are software engineers, but I actually have a little more experience in you know writing code um, mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, I tend to, if, if there's anything involves like really a lot, writing a lot of code, I tend to do it. Although Stacey has written code too. It's just. This is the math. I'm like, you know, you do the hard math. Yeah. <laughs> I do. That linear algebra stuff. That's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I would have paid more attention in linear algebra class if uh, I had realized how much it would be important in video and, uh, you know, color theory and stuff. But, you know, we, we get by. Yeah. For sure. So you just recently announced a brand new disc. And so if you guys are new, uh, two Spears and Munsell. So I'm just going to put this up here. So it's a three disc set. And we're going to back up kind of and talk about maybe some of the story of where this all began. I mean, we know we've got this new product and it's new and improved. And we'll talk about the differences between the original disc and, and the new one. But kind of walk us through like what is what did that look like? Where did it come about on, you know, hey, we really should create a calibration disc so that we can get better performance out of our TVs, projectors, and, and even now, even in our audio system. So kind of maybe walk us through that. So, well, so I think we started off at first looking at test patterns. Mm -hmm. It was actually one of our coworkers, Glenn, was doing scaling and linear light. And we thought that would be interesting. So I think we, Glenn had an idea for a test pattern. And then I also wanted to figure out why color bars had the artifacts between color transitions. And so I wanted to see if we could build a better color bars pattern. And I think that was the very first pattern we had done with our tools. But we were sort of doing that on the side, not doing discs. Because at one point, I knew both Guy Kuo, who created Avia, and Joe Kane, who did video standard, digital video essentials, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if we could get them together, maybe they could produce the perfect disc. That never really happened. <clears throat> And then one day Oppo reached out and said, hey, we're releasing a new DVD player, or no, in this case, a Blu-ray player. We'd like to do a disc with it. Okay. So please make us a disc. So and we had, I think at that point, film. I think we had at that point, we had made some patterns for other people. Well, you know, because we, we had. The first disc we did was for DVDO. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a um, the ABT disc, Anchor Bay Technologies disc. It was bundled mm -hmm. with, our, with our processors. It was a DVD. And... I don't remember if we had done the spider disc at that point or not. Data color spider. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we had created uh, somewhere in there. We created X scaler and yeah. it was. And that we was were... again based originally off Glenn's linear light scaling. <clears throat> yeah, it was Glenn's idea. It was, you know, we created the algorithms. Um, we did, did a lot together. of analysis. We, we did a lot of analysis of like scaling algorithms. This was kind of early days of digital. Um, and we were realizing that a lot of scaling was kind of done half-assed. And this was in, you know, major programs like Photoshop and stuff where they were taking shortcuts basically because speed was of the essence, but we were sort of like, well, if you're doing offline processing, why shouldn't you just do it in super high quality? Mm -hmm. um, do everything at floating point, do everything in linear light, make sure everything is physically um, correct, you know, like as is based on the physical model of how photons interact and so forth. Mm -hmm. This is around and, 2001, just to give you a time frame. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and we built this thing and, you know, like <laughs> somebody we knew at Microsoft had these contacts at, what was it? It was Warner, um, Warner Brothers. And they, they took a copy of X scaler. We basically would like, you know, let them have it and they started scaling video with it and they were like we like the results you know we we were showing them the artifacts because it is subtle like these shortcuts produce pretty good results but you can start to see that um you know like the biggest thing is things like uh, bright lines get thinner and dark lines get thicker when you do scaling outside mm -hmm. of linear light like if you don't undo the gamma curve do the scaling and then redo the gamma curve then you know there's, there's a lot of artifacts, you know, somebody in like a herringbone tweed jacket, it'll get dimmer. You just, you just scale the image and the tweed jacket gets dimmer and everything else stays the same. It's the weirdest thing. It's very counterintuitive. And these are the kind of artifacts that happen because you're scaling in a gamma space. Mm -hmm. And that was fascinating, just exploring that. And luckily <laughs> at this point, both Stacy and I were working on the video team. So it was theoretically in our work, you know, like we were, I mean, yeah, it wasn't exactly what I was supposed to be working on, but you know, 
Um, I think well, my boss also- is. Ret- I think my boss from that time is now retired, and like they can't take back my pay. So <laughs> right. let's just say I was spending a lot of time doing a lot deep dive on like linear light processing and what did that mean and what did it do to the image and how was this important. Mm-hmm. And in the process, we ended up writing a lot of code and creating our own tools to do things like scaling and generating test patterns that we could then scale. And, you know, so a lot of this evolved out of just thinking about video and how can you process video better? Mm -hmm. Like, what are the artifacts that come from the tools that are being used to process video? And a lot of those tools were not doing things correctly, like mathematically correctly. And it was considered good enough. You know, Mm -hmm. it's good enough. It's not perfect, but you know, there's a recognizable image on the screen. That was kind of, it's amazing how that was kind of the, the that was okay, you know? And um, not for people that really care about video. The people at the studios, they cared. They mm-hmm. really cared. But the tools are all written by programmers, you know? Right. And the programmers would be like, I don't know. I take this image and I turn it into this image and they look about the same. <laughs> and, you know, the directors and the producers and the people who are not, you know, programmers, they would be like, well, uh, when I run through this process, like weird things happen to the image. It's basically mm-hmm. the same image, but like all this fine detail gets strange, you know, something happens to it and the programmers would throw up their hands because you didn't really understand the mathematics. And so this was a weird time where like graphics mm-hmm. people were coming from computers and video people were coming from, you know, physical film and, um, there was a lot of um, people talking past each other and it was, it was, it was an exciting time anyway. And then around the same time, WMV came out with uh, the HD discs. So you had like coral reef, but coral reef then had banding in it, which led to us looking into dither and noise shaping. I think when Don first hooked up the first dither, he's like, this looks great. We don't need to do any further, but I pushed him to try noise shaping. And then we saw that at two bits instead of eight bits. And that was dramatically different. Yeah. Yeah. Doing noise shaping changed the game. Um, and all, all of that stuff that we were working on to try to improve video, which ostensibly was to go into Windows, um, all of that ended up being really useful when we were making test disks because we were able to use all that technology to generate, you know, more accurate test patterns. I mean, so you know, it's in, in essence a lot of the, uh, you know, the extra accuracy and all the stuff that we did to make those test patterns, you know, like even better was because we'd done all this work Mm -hmm. to try to improve video processing um, and Microsoft. So I don't know if you remember, I don't think you were in the meeting. I forget there was a display manufacturer that came to Microsoft and this was, I think it was during the development of Vista where we were, we were going to do color management, which I don't think ever really happened. But when we told the display manufacturer this, they freaked out. They're like, but you would make us look like all the other displays. We're like, yes, that's the point. Like, but but why would they buy our product? (laughs) (laughs) I do remember there was a time, I think it was Glenn was talking about, we were talking to a company that everybody should know. It's a company that still exists and their drivers had this huge bug in them um, that it wasn't doing the video processing right. And it was like, it was visible. And, mm-hmm. you know, we debugged it and figured out, oh, yeah, yeah, you made a mistake. You've like fat fingered a, a coefficient on a like a conversion matrix. So the color conversion wasn't being done right. It was kind of right, but it wasn't right. You know, like everything was a little off. And we were like, how do you test this? And they said, well, don't tell anybody, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? What do you mean? No. It's like, well, you test it. So why should we test it? Like, here's a perfect example. You found a bug. We'll fix it. It'll be great. You right. test it. We save money. This is nothing fantastic. like having the end user be the beta tester. Right. We, well, I mean, we talk Microsoft. about that issue in our choosing a color space article at the very bottom of it because it's that color space conversion shortcut. Yeah, I remember that one. But there's oh. a lot of a lot of the code in TVs is written by one guy. Mm. sitting in a cubicle somewhere in Asia or whatever, you know, or who, who knows where, and like, nobody's checking it. Like he's basically, he or she is looking at a manual and going, okay, here's the numbers. And they're literally like reading it and typing it in. And then they look at it and their test is they look at the image. And if it's not like everybody's face is green and the sky (laughs) is purple, he's like, looks good. Ship it. You know, that's that that is literally how a lot of AV companies are doing stuff. This is a real well, eye Joe, opener. Joe Kane once us. told me a story where he was consulting for a company 
And the company said, well, how do you know all this? And he's like, well, I read the specs. And they're like, what specs? And these are the specs design, you know, like the SIMT specs, ITU specs. And this company making displays, they never heard of these documents. So. And if I had not already experienced some of this with myself, I would have not believed, I would have thought that that was an exaggeration, but, oh, I remember, well, do you remember I don't when know, if, uh, this, is, this is really has nothing to do with our disc, but I remember at one point, a large company, I think it might, let's, let's say it was Panasonic, um, their DVD players, if you hook them up, the progressive scan DVD player, if you hook it up to their TVs, like the TVs would lock out a lot of the aspect ratio modes, out of some kind of somebody in the TV division was like, Oh, when we get a progressive scan, that has to be 16 by nine. So we don't need the four by three mode anymore. So it's not available. And I was like, oh, wow. that's obviously not right. This is the same. Mm -hmm. I've got a Panasonic DVD player and a Panasonic TV from the same model year. Mm -hmm. And it's all, you know, it's, it's a, it's foobar. And, I think Stacy met, you know, somebody from Panasonic at the at CES that year and explained this to him and said, "How does this happen?" And he's like, "Well, those guys are in different buildings." Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that's like uh, assuming that's like assuming that the Windows team and the Office team work together yeah. and they're colluding. Yeah. Right. No, yeah, no. There's no collusion between them. It's there's a, no love lost. It's cats and dogs between the office and the Windows team. Yeah, for sure. No, when when the people would be like, "Oh my God, Microsoft is colluding to make all the one software work better with Windows," it's like against themselves, uh, no. maybe. No, not really. Well, anyway, remember, remember when we met Dr. Trigliano? Gary. Oh yeah. Our, so right, our coworker right. Gary Sullivan used to chair. Or, I assume he still chairs, but he chaired H.264 development, H.265 development, probably 266. And he had introduced us to Dr. Trigliano, the founder of MPEG. This is right around the time we found the Chroma bug. And so we met with him to try to get it fixed. But he didn't really, he basically referred to the that problem as a cappuccino maker. It wasn't really part of MPEG's problem. But he, mm. I remember him that, that cappuccino analogy will never, it's forever seared in my brain. It's <laughs> like, yeah. Just the, is the coffee... The coffee company responsible if the cappuccino maker has a has a problem it's like you know his his attitude is the mpeg spec is right you know his job is to make the spec right the specs mm -hmm. right you know if the all the manufacturers are doing the wrong thing it's right there in the spec what they're supposed to do they just didn't do it and we're like but you could communicate with them you know like and he's like eh. my job here's done yeah <laughs> It's protected by a powerful somebody else's problem field. You know? mm. So, yeah, that was a, but it's not that people don't care. It's that literally this is the way things work. You know, mm -hmm. we make the spec, other people are supposed to follow the spec. That's just the way it is. And testing is always secondary in development of AV. And that's, and this, that cycles, you know, that pulls us all the way back to what is this disk for, you know? one of the audiences for this disc is AV manufacturers. We know for sure because they talk to us that AV manufacturers use this disc right. to help them test their equipment. And we're glad of that because we want better equipment. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, sure. We want to watch movies on, on uh, players that don't have chroma bugs and other bugs and, you know, uh, chroma, luma, you know, shifts and mismatches and stuff like that. So, yeah, if, a, if an AV manufacturer asks us to create a pattern, you know, we absolutely will create that pattern and stick it on the disc because some, you know, like it, it helps the whole industry. Sure. Um, so you know, we're, we're really, it's altru entirely altruistic. Everything we do is really, it's. Yeah. So Don talked about, we write a lot of our own tools. Well, one of the tools we use is actually written by Microsoft. It's called Excel. Many problems have been solved with a problem with the solver in Excel. <laughs> Yes, especially color yes. conversion issues. It's like because mm -hmm. you know when we were trying to solve, I think the uh, round tripping of YCBCR to RGB and back. Don would use Excel to try to figure out you know how to make that work. Well, we did or actually write as well. Yeah. yeah, we did write some tools and stuff. We did you know, but like, it's amazing what Excel can do. <laughs> yes, sure. Yes. It's, now, since we were talking about altruistic and the disk and stuff, why don't can we transition maybe into the disk itself and kind of where. I'd like to start, like, where did this disc start? How did we get to, what was the starting point to where we are now with this disc? Because I think there's been a few evolutions of, of this product so far. 
So I think it was around 2017, we were supposed to release a disc just for the press. It would be a small subset of HDR patterns just to get everyone jump started. And then a year later, 2018, we would have a disc that had Dolby Vision, HDR10, and the kitchen sink. Well, that first disc didn't actually ship till 2019. And by then we just expanded it, made it larger and went ahead and gave it to everyone. But then a lot of people were upset because it didn't have pop-up help, it didn't have audio, didn't have Dolby Vision. Mm -hmm. And so we then spent the last four years working on all of the rest. And it actually grew. I don't think it was originally three discs. It's just we just kept running out of disc space. Yeah, I think your first disc, your first product was one disc. Is that correct? The first HDR product. Well, all our yeah. So our very first disc, Blu-ray disc, was one disc. Then our okay. second Blu-ray disc, which was 3D, was a Blu-ray and a DVD. Okay. Then the UHD disc was a single disc, and now we're up to three discs. Right. It's basically two 100 gigabyte discs and a 66 gigabyte disc. Right. So this is what the new product has. You've got three different discs in there. You've got the glasses, I guess, or what would you call that? Blue filter. Oh, no, that's a blue filter. filter. We should okay. probably talk about the blue filter because um, we don't recommend that you use the blue filter. <laughs> and yet people complain if they don't have a blue filter. We tried leaving it out. Oh, that's we're like, Well, we don't recommend you use it. And then people are like, yeah, but I want a blue filter. And we're like, but it's not. That's don't funny. don't use the blue filter and they're like but but what if i want a blue filter where's the blue filter i want the blue filter so we recently so. had someone complain that we 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 dedicated too many pages in our booklet saying not to use the blue filter wow <laughs> interesting well you know it's it's some our experience is that we have spent a lot of time sometimes with people explaining why the blue filter mm. is not mm. like the blue filter was a an innovation of joe kane I'm the credit where credit is due, Joe, on, on commercial broadcast video monitors, they have a button that goes into blue only uh, mode. And then you can adjust using the color bars, you can adjust color and tint mm -hmm. in blue only mm -hmm. mode. And it's a very simple adjustment in a blue only mode. You just turn, it just literally just cuts the power to the red and green guns and only the blue gun is live. And you just, mm -hmm. To, you know, you can learn to do it in like two seconds. You know, you just push the button, adjust the knobs, unpush the button, your broadcast video monitor, the color and tint is calibrated. And consumer TVs generally do not have a blue mode. And if you can get into the back on an old TV, you could actually like sometimes you could literally like pull the power cable to the red and green gun or something like that. And and do that, but that's way beyond what you'd want to get people doing. There's high high voltages back there. You wouldn't want people to do it. I mean, you don't so, want to get inside a CRT TV? <laughs> you, you not unless you're in a room. room. Yeah, unless you have been to the uh, TV repair school, which, you know, <laughs> it will teach you to do lucrative TV repair in just six months of evenings and weekends. And on HD um, monitors, it's not really a blue-only mode anymore because they basically go blue and then they put it in all three guns so you get a black and white image. But it's easier yeah. to see. So, um, yeah, so he had the idea that maybe there's a blue filter that would work. And he found a, uh, gel, uh, it's, it's a, it's a Roscoe gel actually. And it's the same Roscoe gel that, that, um, we're using today, basically. And THX used. And everybody else has used because it just used, happens yeah. to be a really good color filter to filter out the red and green of a CRT TV. Mm -hmm. And it worked pretty well. Most TVs would work pretty well, well enough to actually do the color and tint uh, calibration. Mm -hmm. And uh, we realized using our color theory knowledge that more layers of the gel produce a more selective filter. In addition to darkening, um, if you stack gels, it's not additive, it's multiplicative, if that makes any sense. So mm -hmm. the, the spectrum of the gel, the spectral response curve is like, it's kind of bell curvy. So if you stack multiple layers, the bell curve gets narrower and it gets more selective. It becomes a much more like a notch filter. So two layers is more selective, but darker. Three layers is even more selective, but even darker. So if you're mm -hmm. in a fully dark room and looking through three layers, that's going to give you the best possible selectivity. And on a variety of CRT monitors, it works reasonably well. Like, you know, there's probably, I'd say 80% or, or more of CRT monitors um, with three layers, layers of gel, you can get a decent result. And on a lot of CRT monitors, one layer of gel is fine. So we designed a, a, a 
filter that had one layer on one side and two layers on the other side, and you could fold it over and get three layers. So great, you can do one, two, or three layers with the same filter. Right. And we had the paper optics company design it and build it for us, and it was great. But it really only works on CRT. There's a limited number of like LCD that it will work on because mm -hmm. LCDs tend to have this very spiky spectrum and it's, it's not a bell curve and it's not tight. And so there's a lot of energy leakage from the red and green um, pixels. Mm -hmm. So the more energy leakage you have from red and green, the more it leaks into the blue space, the less this filter approach will work. That makes sense. And then when you started getting TVs with CMSs, you know, which is color management systems, which is in all these HDR TVs, the um, the pixels themselves are not positioned at the three points of the color space for, say, um, you know, two twenty or seven hundred nine or any. You know, they're 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 just going ahead and picking picking filters that are uh, reasonable to manufacture and give them a big. HDR, you know, wide gamut space. And then they're using the CMS to get the colors where they need to be. Well, mm -hmm. all that processing just makes filters completely, they, they absolutely do not work when mm -hmm. there's a CMS in the, um, you, if without a blue only mode, you really can't adjust color intent. Meanwhile, in addition, color intent generally don't need to be adjusted because with analog TVs, you had to just color intent like a, on a, in a, TV station, they're adjusting their monitors regularly. They're, just, they're sometimes mm -hmm. doing it every few hours because, you know, it's all this analog equipment that as it heats up, it, you know, things change and stuff shifts. Mm -hmm. And commercial TVs, the tolerances were not super tight. So when you took it home from the Sears or wherever you bought it, it often was not right. And you mm -hmm. needed to calibrate it or it wasn't be right. It just didn't come out of the factory right. And then at some point, some TV manufacturers in the quest to make their TVs stand out on the Sears floor or whatever, they would just, by default, they would turn up the color because color is basically like a poor man's saturation control. Mm -hmm. And you turn up the color and everything gets more colorful. And now the green of the football field is greener and the sky is bluer and people's faces are all ruddy and everything looks really bold and you put it next to a TV that's calibrated and it looks better, or at least to somebody walking in right. to the AV store. And so that was something where if you just turn down the color to the right level, it would look better. But now when manufacturers put in their vivid modes and stuff right. like that, <laughs> it's rarely that they've turned up the color too much. And even if it's, if they did, you just take it out of vivid mode and mm -hmm. you're, like there's no real reason for color intent to exist in modern TVs. Digital video doesn't have the same issues. It's all solid state, it's all digital. Mm -hmm. And you're you're rarely gonna have a problem that is gonna be solvable by fixing your color intent. So you put all that together and there's not really a reason to adjust color intent anymore. Nonetheless, people want the color intent pattern and they want a blue filter, so. And the, so the Simpty bars, they're designed, the original Simpty bars are designed to do color and tint. And then the HDR Simpty bars, they actually remove the ability to adjust tint because they're like, tint is no longer needed in, in HD. So mm -hmm. long before HDR, long before right. HD. So I don't know. It's, you know, like somebody out there may be wanting to adjust the CRT TV. And honestly, you could use our patterns to do it and the mm -hmm. blue filter. I don't know. And there may be in, there may be some LCD TVs that are not, a wide gamut and you know it might work with but well, with enough layers it works pretty well on an lg oled but i think even with nine layers my sony z9d it does not work at all yeah and by then you're pretty dark right uh so think of it as fan service you know what i'm saying I mean, <laughs> well yeah people get mad yeah, so it's a blue filter for a single pattern out of five thousand patterns wow and if you don't have that filter people get mad yeah so <laughs> I mean, people, it's people what the, complain we on the gotta, internet these, these days. So. <laughs> we got to give the people what they want. So, but we're, you know, so we're explaining why do we include this thing, which we suggest that you not use. And the answer is it's a, it's a collectible, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a collectible. <laughs> That's right. 
Oh, we should have put uh, limited edition. You know, we should have put number. Man, I bought this Spears and Munsell disc, but it didn't include Sign- the blue, signature blue filter edition. Immediately lost seventy five percent of its value. That's right. Yes. But how would you know if you opened it? Because you lost fifty percent of the value just opening it, That's right? right? Just That's taking right. it in a mint. You got to buy one disc to use, and then one disc to keep in mint, so that <laughs> you know, for display purposes. And yeah, you know, absolutely. So the interesting thing, and I didn't know this, but I just assumed that Spears and Munsell, this was like your full-time thing. But as you shared backstage, this is really kind of, I don't know if you'd call it a side project or a side passion. Side hustle? Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the you, phrase these you've days. Got, you've got full-time jobs yeah. or at least, you know, a steady well, job. If this were our full-time you're... job, we'd be living in tents. So mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's made us some money over the years, and we're not unhappy with that because you know money can be exchanged for goods and services. Um, but you know, no, we both have a full time. We were working for Microsoft. We both since left Microsoft, and you know, I own a company that has nothing to do with video. And right. Stacy works for Red. Um, is that okay? It's too late now. <laughs> I, 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 I can't uh, edit it, so everybody yeah. knows. <laughs> Yeah. But, so I work uh, on digital cinema cameras. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's awesome. Super yeah. cool. So Ryan had alluded earlier, you know, talking about the disc. Um, I had a chance to now I'm I'll just say this straight up. I'm not the video file. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you're gonna say tonight, and I'm just gonna go, man, that's that's exciting. And I have no idea what you're talking <laughs> about. Um, because you are way more intelligent than I am, but uh, Ryan is a dealer and I know that he does a lot of calibration. I know Jonathan does a huge amount of calibration in his, uh, as a home theater enthusiast, more on um, the audio side to be quite honest, but yes, yeah. tinkering. Yes. Yeah. But even, even in your group around Kansas city, sure, sure. a lot of you guys are, are really into calibration. I think that this is a huge tool even for consumers, but it's really cool to know that this is a great tool for TV manufacturers, for projector manufacturers. Um, and you know for dealers and like a there's a wide audience that potentially could use this and you mentioned earlier i think it was stacy there's like five thousand files on this disc or three disc set that's a ton a ton of files (laughs) and um i've just got some screenshots we don't necessarily have to go through like what each one of this uh you know uh each section is and kind of a deep dive but those that aren't familiar with the Spears and Munsell disc, just kind of walk us through kind of like the, the overview of, of what this is for and, and what are some of the things that can be done with this? I've got, like I said, I've just got a bunch of different slides of the different menus. And I think there's a couple of test patterns at the end. <clears throat> and we can just kind of talk through that a little bit. Well, okay. Uh, so when we say there are oh, 5,000 yeah. files, oh yeah, I'll go first. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, one of the things we're doing, we're, we basically have duplicate copies of files. Mm-hmm. So for example, on this screen is your configuration screen. And here, uh, I'll point out there's two check marks. There's one next to Dolby Vision and one next to HDR10. Mm-hmm. When you put the disc in and then the player talks to the display, it determines what's, what the capability is. Sure. So this <clears throat> on this particular screen is telling you that you can play Dolby Vision or HDR10. Um, if you plug this into a Samsung display, HDR10 would not have a check mark, but there'd be one next to HDR10+. Plus. So mm-hmm. this is giving you a quick glance at what works. But in this case, you've got Dolby Vision, you've got HDR10+, Plus, and then if you were to select HDR10, the peak luminance section down below would light up, and then you would have six different versions there as well. Sure. And so with HDR10, the metadata is static, which is why you have six versions. Mm-hmm. But with Dolby Vision and 10+, Plus, you've got one version because it's dynamic metadata. What were you going to say, Don? I was going to say that we, we kind of identify three different groups of people that might want to use this disc. There's okay. in, there's sort of enthusiasts, which just represents, you know, people that want their uh, audio video system to work better or they want to calibrate or they want to understand more. A whole group of different kinds of enthusiasts, but, you know, the kind of people who would watch this show. Mm-hmm. Um, there's professional calibrators. Obviously, there's stuff on here that's specifically targeted to them, and there's a cer- certain amount of overlap. Sure. And then there's manufacturers and reviewers mm-hmm. and things like that. So there's stuff to test and evaluate. There's stuff to calibrate. And there's stuff that's really designed for the new user. And in the best possible world, we would have designed three different discs or disc sets. Right. Um, and have like a consumer disc and a, also right. an enthusiast. You know, you know what I'm saying? Sure. But realistically, it just like it, that doesn't pencil out. So we have right. all of the stuff on there. So 
I think the the message is, you know, that we've tried to con to put all the stuff for like a new enthusiast in mm -hmm. section, and uh, that's video setup section, um, and then we've got, you know, more stuff as you as you work your way down the um, the things the main menus, you get into more and more advanced stuff. But some of the later stuff is is really the analysis and the advanced video stuff is really for calibrators and for evaluators, be they reviewers or manufacturers or something like that. And they're kind of interesting to look at and to read about and so forth. But it's really more like if you're an enthusiast, I think it's kind of um, it, it really you, you can go as deep as you want. Right. Um, you know, I mean, all of the stuff I find very interesting. Obviously, we made it. We thought, it, you know, we thought each of these had a point and, and sure. we want it. But I don't think you should be intimidated if you go, oh, my goodness, do I have to understand all of this? <laughs> right. You absolutely do not. You know, yeah. it, the, the video setup stuff is the stuff that um, is going to be useful in calibrating your personal display and also understanding the various modes and switches and stuff on the on the display but as you move your way up the menus you're going to start to see some really obscure and esoteric stuff and yeah. if you don't want to learn about what this is for that's fine you don't you don't need to it's really yeah. it's there if you need it or want it and it doesn't it's not you, know, you don't have to you don't have to use every single pattern on this disc to just right. set up your tv well, i know i was looking through and i'm going i have no idea <laughs> But one thing that's kind of interesting is that, and I think this is really good, is I, I even have a slide. So let's say, for instance, you're on this area of the disc. A lot of the, the test patterns and different things, you can hit the down arrow and it'll pop up a menu and it'll say, okay, here's some more details. Here's how you would use that. Here's um, you know, the parameters that we're looking for. Here's what you want to try to do and accomplish with this. And I think that those little, would you call them tool tips or... Yeah, pop, help help text help, is what we call menu, it. Yeah, okay. pop up help. So, yeah. yeah, bring back this pattern because I think sure. this is a perfect example of a pattern. Yeah. This is a pattern that was Stacy's brainchild, mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. had a bunch of arguments about it because I was like, "This is way too complicated. <laughs> like, people are going to freak out of this nope. pattern." That's not what I wanted. Um, but um, but Stacy wanted a pattern that had a whole bunch of other stuff from other patterns and one one pattern and it would have sort of the core evaluation for what whether a color space this it, essentially every single piece of this pattern represents some kind of problem that we have seen because a player or a tv was in the wrong color space or mm -hmm. the processor in certain color spaces was doing damage to the video image so it seems crazy and complicated, but there's actually only a, it, there's, I don't know. You, you can see in the t a help text, it lists maybe eight or nine separate things. So you're looking for banding, you're looking for artifacts, you're looking for mm -hmm. moiré, you're looking for a variety of different things on this pattern that um, could be wrong with the image. And once you learn how to read all the sections of this pattern, you mm -hmm. can pop this up on a display and it is incredibly revealing. It is, there's so much going on on it, but it is the one-stop shop for understanding problems with a display or problems with your signal chain because lots of things will um, cause issues on this pattern. And once you know how to just work your way around the pattern and look for, look at all the different components, you can tell an enormous amount in this one space. So I, I was a skeptic at first, um, but Stacy turned me around. And I think this is one of the most important patterns on the disc. It's really, it's a cool pattern and it, it teaches you a lot about problems that could occur in video. And if you look at the top left, top right, where you have the four color boxes and bottom left, bottom right, they're sort okay. of mirrors, they're mirrors of each other, but the top boxes are unique because they're not what you call RGB legal. Mm. The YCBCR values are legal, but they can produce RGB values that go way beyond what they're supposed to go beyond. And so I think when this disc was used in 2019, the first release of this disc, we got a call from the value electronics shootout because uh, one particular brand of television produced entirely different colors at the top and mm. everyone is sort of freaking out. But because they're not RGB legal, it's not defined what they're supposed to do. It's okay. true that display is different. doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just right. different. 
because th those the top boxes weren't meant to look at color accuracy they were meant to look at something else what were they meant to look at uh chroma bug specifically okay so when you're saying as an example because i i think a lot of people have interest in this but they don't have necessarily the knowledge to know what to look for when you say chroma bugs can you explain or extrapolate maybe a little bit on what that would look like with this pattern in those top boxes if there was a bug present sure so on the diagonal line specifically you would see um uh, spurious detail look like little tooth marks tooth edges sort of chopped mm. out of it as you went down okay. and you'd see the same marks inside the circles as well okay that would be the biggest thing yeah but uh, there's various chroma problems that can result in for example those um those boxes being dimmer than they should be mm -hmm. if you kind of look at the lower left for example mm -hmm. the, they're very high detail boxes you know you see that blue and yellow kind of um it's a zone plate pattern, but it looks like circles, concentric right. circles. And you've got the diagonal lines and the checkerboards next to it. Like a lot of chroma processing that reduces the bandwidth of chroma will cause mm -hmm. the, the finest detail patterns to get dimmer than the, than the larger detail patterns. And when you see that, you know, there's something stepping on the chroma channel. I see. Um, these little, what we call diamonds that could just look like lines. I'm pointing at the screen. I can't see this. <laughs> I'm sorry. But if you look in the center and there's all these, like, there's these vertical green, uh, sorry, red, and, red blue. and blue. I can't, I don't, can't tell colors. I don't, you know. You sure you're a color guy? <laughs> yeah, I'm the color yeah, that's, guy. That's, that's me. Fair. I'm the color guy. Um, you've got these vertical and horizontal, uh, we call them diamonds. They are very, like, very thin, stretched out diamonds. Okay. If you get up next to if you put this up on your screen and get up next to it, you will see that what it is is a chroma line that is aligned with a Luma diamond. So you've got a black and white, very skinny diamond. So it's thickest in the center and it's very mm -hmm. thin on the edges. And then there is a chroma line that is running right down the middle of it. And on a proper, if everything is going right, the chroma and the luma should be completely aligned. In other words, that colored line should be right smack dab on the money with that diamond. And the, we have the thin and thick sections. It's a diamond because we wanted to have like a, you know, a wide, a medium wide and a thin line because on different displays, it's easier to see one way or the other, but you should see it. It looks, should look symmetrical. There should be just as much leaked, uh, you know, red on the left side is on the right side and it becomes really visible when you have a chroma luma mismatch where the chroma channel is a one pixel or half a pixel or a quarter pixel or whatever mm -hmm. mismatched from the luma and you think how can that happen this is digital video it should never happen of course it shouldn't it's a bug but it does happen and this absolutely makes it incredibly clear it is by mm -hmm. far this is something that only our disk has and it is by far the most sensitive way to see small shifts between the chroma and luma channels and it's kind of amazing you, you, you know when you see this in the modern era there's no reason for chroma and luma to be delayed from each other in the old days it was because of you know analog processing and the chroma channel and luma channel would go through completely different channels and you're muxed and demuxed out of an analog signal and stuff. And so there were all kinds of ways for them to get out of sync with each other. In the digital era, it always represents some kind of code bug in a processing chip somewhere. But it does happen. It's amazing how it still happens. And this pattern, you know, will show you um, any chroma, luma, you know, any, any kind of color shifts of mm -hmm. the luma version of the, the luma part of the signal from the chroma part of the signal. So looking at this pattern on a 4K display, you really need a loop because the pixels are so small, it's hard to see. So you want to put a loop up on your, on your screen to actually see the delay. So one idea I had was, what if I make an HD version? Then when the display scales it up, everything will be bigger and it'll be easier to see. And that does work as long as the display doesn't introduce delay during the scaling, which we found when we did that. There yeah. was at least one brand that introduced delay. So we do have an HD version, not of this pattern, but of those chroma diamonds. We have an HD version and a UHD version, and you can actually check for that. And we added these to the scaling pattern because of that reason as well. Hmm. So, yeah, each, I mean, we could go through each of the sections, but, you know, the help text does um, mm -hmm. go through what you should see. But every single component, there's a reason for it. They're all something that you can evaluate visually. This does not require test equipment. So this is probably the most 
dense information dense pattern but it is all for visual evaluation so this is a pattern that everyone can use um, it's not for calibration it's for evaluation mm -hmm. but it, it turns out in modern in the modern era you know evaluation is often really useful because you have on your player and on your tv you have all of these different controls sure and and you turn them on turn them off you change different modes you know you could force it in various ways with different player tv combinations mm -hmm. you can force it to do 444 or 422 or 420 you can force it into hdr you can force it into 10-bit or 8-bit what happens when you do that Mm -hmm. Well, this pattern is usually the starting point for us in trying to see what does happen. Mm -hmm. Like if you change it from 10 bit to 8 bit, you should start to see banding and those colored ramps on the right and left, you know, those those uh, gradients that you can see where it goes from yellow to blue on the left and goes from mm -hmm. sort of cyan to red on the right. If you go to 8-bit, you should be able to see bands where it, instead of looking smooth, it looks like, mm -hmm. you know, solid colors. And then there's a little, you know, line and another solid color and another solid color that's banding. So those are to see banding where the bit depth is inadequate to make a smooth transition. Mm -hmm. um, you will see chroma. If chroma is getting stepped on, you will see the those diagonals in the corners of the center, you know, that we mentioned before, they will get dimmer and you will mm -hmm. see that. And you can actually go through the modes on your TV and mm -hmm. switch, switch around or turn up the sharpening, turn down the sharpening, and you will see stuff happen on this uh, image. Yeah. And all those so, elements are also available in full screen patterns. Yeah, they, this, there's nothing on this pattern that isn't, I think, on another pattern, a larger right. pattern mm -hmm. that you know, is a, sometimes easier to read. I mean, this is kind of a combination pattern. This was right. Stacy's, like Stacy just wanted a pattern where you could pop up. And <laughs> Throw it all up there and then we can yeah. just go deep at well, it. It's like Stacy Spears Memorial. I can't be a memorial. <laughs> Stacy's still alive, but. We yeah. should turn this into a flag. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So we do have an article, on our website, we do have an article called Choosing a Color Space, which is dedicated to this pattern. Okay. Yeah. For your guys' future, Discs. Can you send this in like a sticker so that we can stick it on stuff? So <laughs> well, I thought know. I would just have it made in a suit out of this <laughs> test pattern suit. Yeah. So, do you guys have any other favorite patterns that really stand out to you on the disc? Well, that's kind we're... of a, it's a really weird question to ask, but yeah, we don't have screenshots of any of this. <laughs> There's some patterns that I think we're proud of where we did something that was. Um, unusual or, or special like mm -hmm. uh, those those chroma diamonds in general when we first generated that pattern i felt really good about that because people had tried guy quo was the first to really try to do a uh chroma delay loom, pattern. yeah no, mm -hmm. yc delay pattern and it you know it the it, reason it's I, difficult to working is because we work in 420 so your chroma channels are a quarter of the resolution of luma so they're soft and fuzzy yeah, so it didn't quite work, and we played around. It, I think it was probably we started thinking about there's got to be a better way to do chroma luma delay, mm -hmm. and and we finally came up with the diamonds idea after like a year of trying out different things and thinking about different things. And it was basically when we realized that symmetry was our friend, that if we created right. a thin symmetrical pattern, mm -hmm. you would be able to see because the left side would be thicker than the right side if the chroma was delayed or chroma was shifted. Mm -hmm. And and then we act, added in a horizontal shift because we realized that bugs in digital video processing could actually shift chroma up or down, which never happened in analog video, but it does sometimes happen in digital video. You can actually have a vertical chroma shift. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm pretty proud of that. I feel like that's unique. It's something we created. It's something that nobody else had. It's the first way to visually evaluate um, YC delay or mm -hmm you could think of it as just chroma shift. Um, and we have a version of the pattern that actually allows you to quantify it. You just look for the line. We, we deliberately pre-shifted a whole set of um, these diamonds by half pixel increments. Mm -hmm. And so you can just read the number. You look for the one that looks the most symmetrical and then sure. read the number under it. And it tells you how much, you know, how much YC delay there is in, half pixel increments so interesting that was fun anyway i i, I think that's really 
it's a good pattern. It's a useful pattern. And it's um, something that took a lot of, like it was easy once we figured out what to do. But, um, and the other thing is that you can only create that pattern in um, directly in YCBCR, at least, you know, we, we to com you have to completely isolate the chroma channel from the Luma channel. And the only way that's going to happen is if you create it in YCBCR mm -hmm. and no off the shelf tool lets you do that. Everything works in RGB and then converts to YCBCR mm -hmm. and that's out of your control. Whereas we wrote, our own tools to generate YCBCR patterns in 420. Man. So, and then that directly goes into the encoder. And Stacy can tell you about, we found encoders that if you fed them 420, they would convert it to RGB, do stuff to it, and then convert, <laughs> and then convert it back. back. Yeah. Oh, no. And so for the new disk, so Donna talked about, well, how do you get, how do you get these digital errors? So for standard definition, for high definition, 601, 709 for years, <laughs> We've had the same structure in 420. It's never changed. Mm -hmm. Well, with 2020, they decided to change it. And so we actually have two versions of this pattern, a 709 and a 2020, because they mm -hmm. literally moved uh, vertically the, the location of Chroma relative to Luma. So before it was stored in between the, the Luma samples. Now it's co-located with one Luma sample. And because of that, uh, there are people who use, or companies that use the 709 algorithm for HDR, and you end up with a vertical shift of half a pixel. Uh, which, is, which is why we have the vertical diamonds and the horizontal diamonds. So, and if, yeah. you, more, if you can't get it wrong, you, you will get it wrong. This, the more you talk about this, the more people I think should realize that this industry is just as messed up as any other industry <laughs> with things that are done differently oh, yeah. and nobody following a format that should be yeah. following and everybody should be and reading dude. directions, but them not reading directions. And why have you guys, you know, why can't you give me my blue filter? That's right. We do. We are giving it, I know. <laughs> and it's a it's it's a really good blue filter. I mean, in I a need weird way. Gels, though, Don. <laughs> yeah. Well, so for this disc, we thought we could see if we could do better with the gels. And Don mm -hmm. went out and spent what a thousand, two thousand dollars buying every filter gel he could find. We found one that was glass that was eighty dollars that performed mm -hmm. worse than this blue filter we have. Oh wow! Mm. Yeah. So. So yeah, we we did dichromatic filters. We did you know industrial grade notch filters. We looked at all everything, and we combined just... filters to try to take two different curves yeah, to overlay right. them on top of each other. That right. didn't work. <laughs> yeah. It's a good idea though. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna change topics here a little bit, and I'm gonna I want to know where these images came from. Mm -hmm. This image we use all the time to showcase tone mapping because it's very difficult for many displays to tone map. So I want to know, because this is the demo material that's been on your guys' discs for a while, mm -hmm. where did this material come from? And what was the thought process for putting this material on there? Why were certain things chosen? Why is there a reason it's in specific order? Um, I've seen other material, and I don't know if it's on this one, where you guys break it down into like quadrants and you have a heat map and um, a... That's the HDR analyzer. Trail. Yeah. yeah. So take us through that like what was the process where did this stuff come from why does it exist um so, is the is the analyzer on there i i it may be i just haven't spent enough time with the disc um so take us uh, through it. when we did our very first blu-ray disc we needed demonstration material you always want demo material for mm -hmm. people to look at before and after mm -hmm. so i think i looked at stock footage and stock footage when you license stock footage this is back again 2007 time frame it was all 1080p 30 it was compressed mm -hmm. with jpeg already sure and uh they're very restrictive on their their licensing right so if you want to use this footage you can only use so many seconds of it or you got to put our logo here or there mm -hmm. and it, the quality was just bad mm -hmm. so that was when i actually uh red had come out at the time with their first 4k camera for seventeen thousand five hundred. so i bought one and we went out and shot our own material the dedication nice. yeah so we did that for the first few discs Actually, we did that. So the and red for the one, 3D disc, you borrowed another red <laughs> camera and we put it on a dual bar. And yeah, man. So it, it was the red one for the first disc. It was the red Epic MX for the second disc. And then for the first HDR disc, basically, I was one of six people who had the VistaVision 8K camera from Red. This okay. is before I worked for them. And so I made a deal with Clark Dunbar, who shoots stock footage for a living. He travels around the Southwest and shoots footage. I said, I will loan you my camera for as long as you want in exchange for rights to the footage you shoot. Nice. Because normally like to license this, it might be a few yeah. seconds. You might pay several thousand dollars, depending sure. on which resolution you yep. want. Yeah. So uh, in fact, the Super Speedway clip we licensed, I think we paid $2,000 for six seconds to mm -hmm. use it for three mm -hmm. years. Okay. Ah. 
<laughs> That's crazy. And that was on the first disc. So yeah. Anyways, Clark went out and shot just a bunch of material. And there's so much footage that we didn't use. Mm -hmm. And so I just sort of went through and picked things. I wanted bright content, dim content, colorful content. I wanted sure. stuff that was wide gamut. It was just picking a lot of stuff. This this is one of my favorites for the same reason as well, because tone mapping algorithms have a trouble uh, maintaining the detail in the snow yeah. without it blowing out. Well, is I don't think one people realize how, are... how differently different algorithms will react and behave. Yeah in these particular instances well there's no stand well, so uh, outside of dolby so you know dolby created the hdr that we use today they created the tone curve they created the tone mapping and they said okay we'll give you the curve for free but the if you want to actually play it back in a consumer space you got to license our algorithms mm -hmm. a lot of companies didn't want to do that so every company decided to start doing it themselves remember dolby started this probably 2000 i think the pulsars from 2009 so Dolby was doing this re research back in 2006 2007 mm -hmm. and the format launched in 2014 so they're you know, seven plus years ahead of everyone else in the industry. And, uh, but you know, the algorithms are proprietary. There's no standard on how everybody should do it. So everyone's just taking their best guess. Yeah. And is this, Stacy? is this something that you shot or is this Clark's Clark shot? shot this. So there's four Seattle shots that myself and Tyler went out and shot. The Space Needle mm -hmm. shot, the Tulip shot. Um, there's a Ferris wheel shot, which is downtown right. Seattle. And there's one other one, which I'm forgetting now. And then there's one of an LA, uh, an LA aerial shot that Phil Holland shot mm -hmm. and let us use. And then, uh, so I did the edit, Dolby did the grade. Mm -hmm. And for this disc, Colorfront helped us process it. So on the first, on the previous disc, when we exported from Resolve, which is the software that Dolby used to grade the footage, okay. um, Resolve hard clip the gamut. So everything is supposed to, so the camera can shoot beyond 2020. Cameras capture, they can capture IR, they can capture, you know, UV. Yep. All kinds of stuff. Very, very wide spectrum. Anyway, so Resolve is supposed to map anything beyond your target, in this case, 2020, back into 2020. And for the SDI output during monitoring, they appeared to do that. But when you actually render, they don't. They just hard clip mm -hmm. it. And so for the last disk, we used some tools to try to recover that detail, and it worked pretty well. This time around, we instructed Dolby to, to render an open EXR file, which is a floating point file. And for colors that are outside the gamut, they show up as negative pixel values. We then took that footage, worked with a company called Colorfront that makes a program called Transcoder that's pretty much ubiquitous across the industry for HDR creation. Yep. And they created a special pipeline that remapped the, the, that footage back in, which is why we have cleaner colors and more detail and it's sharper in this version than the previous disc. Wow. So you learn as you go. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody does. Yeah. And just for anybody that doesn't know, so I can put this into context for people, if you put this this image on different displays, it's mm -hmm. going to behave very differently. And a lot yeah. of displays that don't have Dolby Vision, what ends up happening is the tree line in the back virtually disappears. Mm -hmm. All of the detail that's in the bottom, if you put this at a high nit value, all of this detail will vanish and these horses will change colors. So it's very revealing and it's very eye opening to showcase because it's, you can easily identify what a display is doing and how it's treating tone mapping. And then you kind of wonder well, what else has been wrong when I've been watching all of my HDR content. So there's a question about the different versions on the disc. So there, there's one master that's the 10,000. And from there, we actually use Dolby vision to render out the 2000, the 1000 and the 600. And those are all individually encoded. And then we also have the one you asked about, which is the HDR analyzer version. So the HDR analyzer is, again, the company Colorfront, their transcoder software has an analyzer built in. And we basically played the montage to their software and uh, it rendered out over SDI and that we used another device to capture it and record it into ProRes. Then I took that and encoded it for the analyzer version. So each version is in fact unique tone map down and it's written into the metadata. So the, the person had mentioned that they're not seeing a difference, but the 1000 has uh, mastering display or mm -hmm. mastering display luminance and max CLL set to 1000. The 350, there is no 350 version. There's a 1000, 2000, 600, and the 10,000. And there's an SDR version. The previous disc, the SDR was derived from HDR. This disc, the SDR was hand graded to SDR. And so what the colorist did was he did the HDR version. He took a few months off, then he did the SDR version without ever looking at the HDR version because you want to mm. basically do it for the, the format itself. That makes sense. Because you can't, SDR cannot look like HDR. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can make HDR look like SDR, but you can't go the other way. 
So he did the SDR version and then he perceptually matched them and he applied sharpness because HDR, the brighter you get or the more contrast, the sharper the image looks. You get mm -hmm. this perceived sharpness. Yes, depth. Well, speaking of questions, we got a handful of them here. I'm going to throw this one up there. Oh, you know what? I'm going to remove your image because now we're hiding some folks. Um, Neil said, appreciate the $10 super chat, Neil. He says, so would calibration from this disc be a close comparison as if you had your TV calibrated by a professional calibrator, we can still, still can't get into like the service menu, like a professional can. So can this be, get as close to like a professional calibrator? So the analysis section has all the windows patterns a professional calibrator would use, mm -hmm. at least most of them. Um, so, but you still need the, the test equipment. You still yep. need the mm -hmm. color color emitter and the software. And these days, a lot of stuff you no longer need to get into the service menu. They put everything you need either into the main menu or okay. software like Calman can actually uh, talk to the display and access mm. the controls necessary. Yep. I have a question for you guys on this topic. Um, I know when we've done some projector calibration lately, we've noticed that bulb-based projectors behave differently than laser-based projectors. I'll give you, for instance, uh, a guy came over from the local community. He used an X-Rite i1 Pro to calibrate the JVC NZ7. It's a laser projector. But that... I, that I1 Pro is made for bulb projectors. And when we were done, the, the gamma was off, the colors were off, it looked bad. It just looked generally washed out. He downloaded a few months later, he found a profile for a laser JVC laser projector and then recalibrated the same device and now it looked good. So if you ever watch a, a video, like a, a review on an OLED monitor, you'll notice that in the reviews, those OLED monitors look terrible on camera. I, I mean, I just kind of... I'm curious how all that relates. Do you guys have to have different content? And I don't own this disc yet, but do you have to have different content for different types of displays if you're running like some sort of hardware device calibration? Or how does that play into it with these different display technologies? So those issues are both part of the color matching function used, it's the, which is the math behind it, the, the, the mathematical model made to do the calibration or to understand the color. But the other part is um, a colorimeter has filters in front of it. And those are typically originally designed for CRTs or designed for a certain display technology. And mm -hmm. the profile you mentioned, you'll, you you uh, you would actually use a spectroradiometer, mm -hmm. which would would measure the display and it would create a profile for the particular meter. So there's a company called Colorimetry Research that makes both of them together with a bracket, and you'll see them sit next to each other. Mm -hmm. And then software like Calman will then put up a pattern, measure it with this one, measure it with this one, and calculate the correction filter and apply mm -hmm. the profile to try to yep. work for that display. I think there's there's some deep color science going on here where a laser projector has a different spectrum you know you, you think of a red green blue you know all all display technologies are based around red green and blue mm -hmm. but what's not obvious is that there's an infinite number there's literally infinite number of spectra that will look like the same color to your eye um the your your eye evaluates the whole spectrum in a sense i mean it's a whole there's a whole bunch of chemistry involved and, and stuff but your eye is sensitive to three overlapping spectra of light which we thought call red green and blue um the pixels on your monitor the pixels on your projector and so forth are stimulated by a spectrum that can vary amazingly widely and still look like the same color so you're what you're dealing with is the difference between like the the colorimeter is is optimized around a specific spectrum and if you use it with a device that uses a different spectrum even though it looks the same to your eye it doesn't look the same to the colorimeter mm -hmm. a spectroradiometer which is a much more expensive device um, can evaluate color exactly the way your eye uh, evaluates color and it can give a perfectly accurate view of what that color will look like to your eye whereas colorimeters use some shortcuts to keep the, the the price of the device down so in order for a colorimeter to work properly with a particular device that has not been you know it doesn't have a profile for well it, it needs a profile it, it, mm -hmm. it, a colorimeter has to be reprofiled for a new kind of device and that's that's ultimately what you're describing well and every colorometer is going to be slightly different it's based on the color filter because they all basically have little red, green, and blue filters in front of it. Yeah. That, you know, I mean, so does, in, in a sense, so does a spectroradiometer kind of. I, it, it's not actually done with little red, green, and blue filters, but it's it's all about evaluating. No, a colorimeter, yeah. A, 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 right, but a spectroradiometer uses a slightly different technology right. to be more accurate. But 
theoretically, you could make a colorimeter that was just as accurate as a uh, spectral radiometer, but practically you can't. As, <laughs> as maybe Yogi Berra said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, <laughs> there is. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, and the other thing I mentioned earlier was the color matching function. So mm -hmm. oftentimes you'll see that CIE, that horseshoe shape thing, the CIE diagram, which shows you sort of uh, green, red, and blue on it in a triangle. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the one we use is from 1970, or, or is it 19, I forget which, there's several, 1960 something and 1970, basically the they original keep one is 31. But yeah, yeah. So yeah, 1931 is the horseshoe and okay. that's the linear model, linear XY. 1976 is the UV, the perceptual one. And they keep basically each one of these is made with groups of people. So I think the one from the thirties is probably a dozen middle-aged white men from Europe and their vision. Right. And so as, as these models have improved, they've taken in different uh, genders, different ages. The sure. problem is we're still using the older one, which is why sometimes when you calibrate an OLED, it might look green when mm -hmm. it says D65 versus another display technology, which doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so people have created offsets for that as well. So we also need better color matching functions to, to color model all is this. It, 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 like understanding color theory it's really counterintuitive we're sort of used to our own sensory apparatus and how it works and trying to understand how spectra maps to this tri-stimulus you know our eye has three different rods and they're they're uh, sensitive to three different you know color spectrums but light is not does not exist in three different colors it exists in this continuous spectrum you know mm -hmm. a rainbow is a continuous spectrum and um, a lot of physical devices don't react to color the way our eye does. I mean, that's the whole colorimeter versus spectral radiometer thing, where spectral radiometer is this very expensive scientific device that actually reads the entire spectrum and then figures out, applies an evaluation function to it that matches your eye's evaluation. Well, and uh, not all spectral radi spectro radiometers are equal either because you know, the mm. spectrum Don's talking about is in nanometers, low nanometers to high nanometers. And some have like two, some have, uh, what, it's basically the, the resolution of the nanometer. Yeah, two versus five versus eight. And right. you might pay a lot more for that. Yep. Yeah. So, and then this is, this is uh, a lot of modern technologies use these um, spectra that are very spiky, you know, mm -hmm. like the old spectra on the, uh, well, like a, an incandescent bulb or the sun, the spectrum is pretty smooth, you know, it's a, and so there's not as many opportunities to have, you know, really divergent views of what a color is, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I, um, when you have a really spiky spectrum, like you get from modern technologies like LEDs and uh, fluorescent bulbs and, you know, the kind of high end fancy filters they use to make these wide gamut TVs, um, it's a lot easier for stuff to read improperly and for like these colorimeters to read something radically wrong because they've been calibrated for a different set of spectra. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it. Well, I was going to say there's other things like, uh, you know, I don't know if you've heard the word metamorism. Some people call it metamorism and talk about metrology. So as we get older, our, our vision changes. So the mm -hmm. colors you see when, Maybe when you saw Star Wars in 77, you might saw one lightsaber. And it's, let's say you saw it again today, assuming, you know, the film wasn't changed by right. the director, it would be a different color today. <laughs> and, and with the wide gamut that we have, 2020, you and I may right. see different colors, but we don't right. know we see different colors. Oh. <laughs> now we're getting into philosophy. Man, that's, this, that's, this is why that's messing my brain right there. there. This, is all very, this is all very hand wavy, high level. Uh, yeah. It, it, our, there's a school, RIT, Rochester's Institute of Technology, and Mark Fairchild runs the program, and they're certain mm -hmm. they're pretty much the experts in the world on this subject. So you can get a degree in this if you want. Mm -hmm. Amazingly oh. enough, one of the original color matching systems was created by like my twelfth cousin or something, <laughs> um, a guy named Munsell, M-U-N-S-E-L-L. -L, the Munsell color system is still used in some industries. Right. Yeah, in New York City. Anyway, not New York City, New York State, but yeah. So I. Not that that has anything to do with anything, but coincidence, yeah. Coincidence, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I, just out of curiosity, as you say, our eyes change as we age and so forth, and what we see uh, with audio frequencies, we lose our hearing sensitivity to the higher frequencies. With our eyes, what do we lose sensitivity to? Like depth of color, or what? What? What goes first as we age with eyes? That uh, I could not answer. Mm. Uh, well, I didn't I mean would... to put you on the spot. I just yeah, thought yeah. maybe, yeah, yeah. I think you're even saying like 
even just natively, our eyes see colors differently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even without the aging part. Like two but people, like you, you and I, yeah, color. two forty year old people can see different colors, right, and then women wild. I think have can see even more colors than men can. Mm. At least that's the excuse we make. <laughs> <laughs> well, well cool you thing. know, that's you'll see the goggles. The, the, like my my wife, if she's trying to evaluate, if she's trying to figure out what she's going to wear, she takes yeah. clothes and will take them out to the to a room that's got a lot of windows so she can right. see it under sunlight. Sure. And that totally makes sense because right. interior lights, at least in our house, are all yeah. LED. And sure. two colors can look the same under LED and different under sunlight or vice versa. It's not one or the other. But until you see it under sunlight, you know, you're really not seeing necessarily the full spectrum because that spiky spectrum from the LEDs may be actually cutting out certain frequencies that are key to telling the difference between two different pieces of fabric. They look, you know, like the gold so, standard is sunlight. Before I worked at Microsoft, actually before a couple of companies before that, I worked at a fashion company and when they would evaluate fabrics, they had special lighting they viewed all fabrics under as they were buying the fabrics to make the clothes. So that explains why when I put on black pants, my wife's like, why are you wearing blue? <laughs> like, These aren't blue. They're black. I promise you. We're looking at them. We're seeing two different colors. Well, there was we the dress that went across the internet a few years back. Yeah. yeah. Was it gold or blue or gold or purple or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. yeah. That sure. was Michael's dress. It was really, no, it was not. <laughs> it was his pants. Yeah. My wife great. and I have a years long feud on whether our mixer is blue or purple. Uh, we both oh. don't think we're colorblind, but <laughs> there's That's that little distinction. You, so, you must go get a picture of this mixer now, Jonathan. Yeah. So I just that redid my I just redid my garage and mm -hmm. I put gray paint in the garage and it looked gray initially. Mm -hmm. But once we put in these particular LEDs, the walls look green now. Yeah. But if you take that and outside into the sun, they look gray again. Because yeah. I actually that took the paint outside, sense. took pictures of it, yeah. but in the garage it looks green. Yeah, that makes total sense. The light can change that. Um, it was great. I saw several people earlier at the beginning of the show. They said they've got some of your original discs. Um, Miles even said that he bought the last edition last year. So he said he'd been enjoying that as well. Got a couple of the questions here, if you guys don't mind. Oh, yeah. Uh, Home Theater Nerd says, what frequency range do you use for Atmos test tones? 500 to 2,000 hertz or full range? Uh, that's pink noise, so it'd be, it would be limited. Let me check real quick. Actually, uh, can you go back to your screenshots? It should. Sure. I think it's in. Let me bring but you know, it's, it's not in your screenshots. Oh, it wasn't. No, but I yeah, I think the only thing quick. I had was here. Let's see. It's the test tones that Dolby recommends. Well, we'd worked uh, with THX originally on that one, mm -hmm. so it's uh, five hundred hertz to two kilohertz. Okay. At minus 30 dB for the mains and minus 40 dB for the LFE. And the LFE is also 30 hertz to 80 hertz. Okay. What and I did notice, on? like, they're on, that's on disc three. So yeah. we ran out of room on disc one. So all the audio, te all the Atmos tones are on disc three. I'm going to yeah. go look at those tonight. Yeah. Yeah. They actually, I, I was listening to those to in them. the theater room. And so it actually will, there's a bunch of different tests. They'll, you know, track from, say, your left front all the way across the front of the screen, front to back. You can do, around like your bed layer, around your Atmo speakers. So there's definitely several several test like options for you there. Were those on the previous disc? No. Mm -mm. I don't think so. Mm. So basically our first and third disc didn't have audio on it and our second and fourth do. Mm. It's a pack. You guys mm -hmm. realize that the only reason I have a UHD disc or disc player is for your your disc. It's the only thing that sits in it and that's the only thing that it does is play your guys' <laughs> content. And but it doesn't so well, right? But why though? I mean, there there's good UHD content out there. Especially no, I have Kaleidoscape. Yeah, got, like I do Kaleidoscape. other things. But that's not, the only reason like that. I have a physical disc player is for the Spears and Munzel. <laughs> right. Munzel disc. Well, and Kaleidoscape's a high quality format. Yeah. But if you compare it to streaming, right? Streaming, you can't control oh, yeah. the bandwidth, and it breaks yeah. up. It, yeah. Or the programs get removed, which is the worst. Mm -hmm. So I've got. So I guess what I'm saying is, find a way to make it digital, so I can get rid of my disc player. Mm. It's just work. Lots, <laughs> lots of work. Just work and money, Ryan. I mean, that's just the way it works, right? Yeah, we gotta, take out the the blue filter and it should be easy. Yeah. We got a few comments along those lines on the Discord chat that are saying, yeah. like, hey, is there a way to get digital or get it through a streaming service? And I know you guys were talking a little bit about that before the call, but you might dip into that little section a little bit too. So right now, to give you an idea, 
of the 5,000 test patterns, I think it took three months of machine time to encode that content. And mm -hmm. a lot of the static patterns are only nine frames long. If you want to put them on a USB stick, they need to be running video, which is at least one minute long, which is 1,440 frames. So the encode time would probably be closer to six months doing what we did last time. Wow. Could people simply pause the, the, the Well, video? nine frames is like that. So you got to be very fast. And it's well, nine if frames. We, I, so I guess my point was it wouldn't top. have to be a minute long. It could be... 10 seconds or well, sure, you but have we, to deal with HDMI handshakes and well, all and, kinds uh, of other stuff. To give you an idea, let me actually again pull up this. I forget the file sizes. So I'm just going through the tools real quick. Mm -hmm. So a single frame, one frame file uncompressed in 10 bit 420 is 24 megabytes. Mm. So to make a 10 second file, that's 240 frames. You know, it's what, 240 megabytes mm -hmm. times 5,000. It's a lot of drive space. Mm -hmm. right. We could probably figure out a way to... Yeah. We'd uh, really want to make a small subset of patterns. Yeah. Right. Yeah, definitely not the whole three-disc set, but just some and, core and, ones that people could use. And as I mentioned if, earlier, we had trouble with some displays. So mm -hmm. LG, for example, it will honor the folder structure you create on a USB stick. So if you okay. can organize the files right. on Sony, they don't do that, or at least the Z9D. So everything mm -hmm. gets pushed into on screen at once. So you can't, you okay. lose organization. Right. And then with the Sony, not all my files would play. Whereas mm -hmm. on LG and on Oppo, they all play. And on Samsung, they all play as well. So it's a lot of work to ensure compatibility. You so. guys should just write on your disk, just say, not for Sony. <laughs> <laughs> now we, there is a, a, a test pattern app that hasn't been released yet for Apple TV, not from us. Mm -hmm. And as a test, we have patterns on there. And so they're nine frames long and they pause in the last pattern. So mm -hmm. that okay. scenario could work. It's just, again, a lot of work to do that. And, and there's control. no worry with compression or anything through Apple TV if you were to do it through a streaming service with these patterns? Oh, in this case, it's actually playing our files directly off disk. Oh, well, okay. not off disk, off a USB stick. So you can plug the USB. Well, with, oh. this app can actually pull it off. Uh, I think they actually bundled all our files into the download package. So okay, it's he was thinking generator. like you could, you're streaming it. But it's yeah. like could you stream the test patterns, though, theoretically? Well, theoretically, yes, but you would have to work with the, the, the company, that the streaming service. You'd have to provide them with the source files. They would have to encode it usually, because hmm. every every streaming provider has a different workflow. They yeah. take different. They ingest different content, and they go I, through a different process. I guess my point is, is you're not worried about compression or anything necessarily for the test patterns. Not really the demo content, but is compression affecting absolutely a lot a lot of your test patterns? Yeah. So with this disc is the first. So um, with this disc, I encoded every test pattern. What I think at 92 times or 96 times. And for each test pattern, I pick the best one, the closest to lossless. Because mm -hmm. we're not we're a lossy format, visually you're not going to see any difference mathematically. On some patterns, there will be differences. Okay. We go to pretty insane lengths yeah. to try to deliver the finished, you know, to, we look at the final output and say, you know, of the decoding process and say, how can we make this just a little better? For some mm -hmm. patterns that are designed to be evaluated with test equipment, it matters. For others, it's just really more of a an attitude thing. It's like yeah. everybody, who, if you get a test and, and calibration disk, you want to know that the people that made it are really finicky. And, and there's a reason sure. that they're nine frames long. So some pa so you add an iframe and you have P and B frames, the way compression works. An iframe is a complete image. P and B is just the difference between the current frame and the previous frame. So an iframe can't always capture everything. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you need a P frame or a B frame to capture more of that data, which is why some patterns will be lossless in one, some will be two, some will be four frames. So we made everything nine frames. So by the time you get to the last frame and the player pauses on the last frame, it's as good as it can be. For a streaming service, it's going to be running video, so it's constantly going to be fluctuating. Right. The bits will, the pixels will be yeah, This is something we've had patterns that essentially strobe because of just the, you know, the GOP structure of MPEG video, where it keeps kind of it gets fuzzy and then it resets and then it gets fuzzy and it resets. And if you play with the encoder and you get the bit rate high enough, you can usually fix that. But mm -hmm. so these patterns are very detailed and you can't lose any of the detail where, you right. know, it's not like a movie where you can lose a few of the things and it's not visually, um, it doesn't make a big difference visually sure. for us. It's, it's important. So each of these would have, we'd have to go through an encoding process that, 
preserves as much of the detail as possible and is compatible with whatever format, be it Kaleidoscape or streaming platform. And then when you get to streaming platforms, mm -hmm. the number of different copies of each video stream that somebody like Netflix or Prime Video has to store on their servers, you know, they have different versions for every single, in some cases, not necessarily every single, but every single sort of destination platform because the chipsets on an LG are different from the chipsets on a Samsung, which is different from the chipsets on a Roku, which is different from the chipsets on a uh, Fire TV, which is different from an Apple TV. So they just generate different mm -hmm. versions of the same movie, show, whatever. They run it through an elaborate, you know, server farm that takes and encodes it all the different versions and then at different bit rates so mm -hmm. that, you know, if they get congestion and they can't get the full bit rate to your TV, they can drop down, hopefully without you noticing too badly. So it'll drop down from 4K to maybe uh, 1.5K down to 1K down to even further or they'll try to keep it 4K, but at a lower bit rate. So the compression artifacts will get a little higher, but presumably it, the output is still 4K, just just fewer bits. So, and, and everybody's got their own proprietary system, but the total number of files that they will generate for one TV show or one movie can be kind of insane. Like, and they're right, all... They, they still have to support an Xbox 360 today or a Roku from you know 10 years ago. They still have to support these old devices, and those old devices may not support HVVC. And of course, they, they try to figure out, you know, like, oh, this whole class of devices all can support this format, and this other set of devices can support this format. But as the formats proliferate, they just keep adding them to their server farm, and like, you know, they just the, the kick off a build or whatever, and, you know, they'll just re encode all of this content um for a new device that they're going to support and and hopefully this will get better and not worse because they're be getting more standardized you know mpeg formats or um the, the there's fewer and fewer chipsets and they're more and more compatible so i think everybody in the streaming business is hoping that eventually they'll get it down to one or just a handful of formats that they have to deal with but you know sometimes the difference between the one for one platform and, the, and a different platform you know, is very, very similar. It's just the same encoder, but with one mm -hmm. switch turned on for one output and turned off for another output. But they got to store both of them because, you know, this device only works when the encoder turns on this thing, mm -hmm. this feature, and this device only works when the encoder turns off this feature. And it's really, it's a, it's a huge problem. It's a huge back end problem for these streaming platforms to deal with the proliferation of different devices that can run their app and can play back content sure They're all, yeah anyway now, don's point though all of that the reason you have the different uh, resolutions and bit rates is to, is to try to keep it smooth and continual playing when your bandwidth changes mm -hmm. but, but for, for us we for like us, to control we can, all for us, of the we could encoding. have a single file yeah but for us we could have a single file and, we're talking to we, one of the companies they didn't have a, a method for us to get for example, 420 into their pipeline. Their, right. in, their ingest was always RGB. Or it was always we ProRes. would not want to hand them a master file and say, hey, run this through all of your various encoders and it's fine right. if you split this out at you know two bits per second. Right. It's fine. No, we would be like, eh. I mean, well, I don't know. For a large enough check, sure. No, but <laughs> <laughs> exactly. but again, so for, for patterns we create in 420, if they only ingest RGB, then that 420 gets converted to RGB, which yeah, then kind of I breaks mean, the pattern, and then they convert right. it back to 420. And so, speaking so, of 420 and RGB, just totally random question: When you're dealing with a player like an Apple TV, Nvidia Shield, or any of that, what should you set your video settings at? That's what that fancy pattern was for. And choosing color space article is to figure out which output to set, whether it's of course, RGB. You can't get that pattern onto your NVIDIA Shield, right? Or, so that's a mm. convenient answer. From but six. you can get it on an Apple TV <laughs> if you have if you have the if you have the media file and you have the Infuse app, you can yeah. do it. So it works for me at home. Oh, okay. yeah, you can great, use Plex great. and stuff if you have the yeah. media file. Now, yeah. recently on a previous mm. uh, interview we did, there was the issue that came up about how Apple TV's uh, YCBCR output is wrong, and so I recently measured that. It is wrong for SDR only and at certain code values, but it turns out it's also wrong for RGB in mm. a different direction. So they're both wrong different of ways. Of course it is. Right. Because everyone is like, oh, you got to use RGB high because it's right. No, it's wrong as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm. 
Practically speaking, <laughs> if you're just playing the odds, uh, I think that there's two formats that are the most useful to use. One is the one that's closest to the source. So 420 10-bit for modern content is well, usually the closest to the source. So that's not a terrible choice because you, the idea is... It's well, a terrible the, choice. Well, okay. <laughs> so in it's a terrible, practice, it's in a terrible practice, choice. It's a terrible choice because there's no flag to tell you if it's 709 or 20, 20, 420 over HDMI. It's only there at the bitstream level. So you really need to be 422 as a minimum. Yeah. Right. But if you know that the content, <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. For SDR, um, HDR both. <laughs> right. So yeah. the other one is the highest possible bit, bit depth and uh you know, so 444, 420 or RGB, you're then assuming that the player is not stepping on it with its video processing because it's got to mm -hmm. up convert everything to 444 because nothing mm -hmm. is coming in at 444. Correct. Nothing's even coming in at 422. Everything's coming in at 420. Mm -hmm. So if you output 422 or 444 to your television, the player is up converting it. And then the yeah. play, the television has to up convert whatever format to 444 RGB because the panel is driven by RGB. So if you say, all right, your video is coming into your set-top box at 420 YCBCR because all video compression that in the practical real world that is not in a lab somewhere is 420 YCBCR, either in 709 or 220, uh, 2020 um, format, yep. mm -hmm. um, color space. So your player of whatever kind or set top box has got to convert that into whatever you the is negotiated between the display and the player. So if it goes up to 422, all right, your player has to have a processing chip that is going to convert the 420 to 422. Now the the display inherently has to be RGB to actually drive the physical display. So it's converting that 422 to 444 and then RGB often in one step, sometimes in two steps. And some of the things that we found is that if you feed 422 into a display and may convert it back down to 420 for some kind of processing chip, or you feed it 444, but it converts it back to 422 for some kind of processing stage. So there can be times when even though there's all these different processing stages, that there's some middle stage like 422 YCBC. CR that actually has the fewest processing steps and the least artifacts. But, you know, it's in the absence of test patterns, all you can really do is pick one that seems to work well and mm -hmm. um, whatever device you trust the most, try to do the most processing on that device. So right. you go all the way to 444 RGB if you can. And if that device can do it right, then great. At least the, it's all happening in one chipset on one device. Thanks. Yeah. So I'll give you a real world example. So the LG C3 and G3 have a new 444 option in the menu. It's available on the previous displays, but it was done by changing the icon of the input label to, uh, to PC. So what's on our disk is 420. You so should it's, pause for just a second, Stacey, and just make it clear that it literally is changing the icon. You change yes. the icon to the PC icon. This is like the most Easter eggy <laughs> way imaginable. When I heard this, I'm like, who came up with this idea? And the answer, well, Stacy knows, but to be fair, I think they, I think they fixed that with a firmware update because I got a C2 kind of a little bit later, like six months later, and mine automatically detected the PC icon to what you're saying, exactly what you're saying on an LG C2. Maybe six months after they released? But this is not for a PC source. This is for a video source. So okay. you want to use PC mode on a video source because okay. uh, that puts you into 444 mode. Okay. So, I see what you're RGB yeah. mode. Yeah. No, it's 444 YCBCR mode. Oh, okay. So what happens is, though, if we're 420 on disk, so through the LG, it shouldn't matter if we output 422 or 444. We should get the same image, but we don't. And uh, if you put up our zone plate pattern, the center of the zone plate is bright, and then the edges get dimmer, but it should be the same brightness all the way across the frame. When you go into 444 mode, it's equal brightness all the way across. So in that particular television, they're actually converting from 444, or even if you send in 422, they're converting up to RGB and back down multiple times. Mm. So 444 mode is the only one that takes in 444 and doesn't convert it. It keeps it mm. as I that feel mode. like we just need to take Stacy and Don and put them up here and have everybody else... Listen to them, to them and then make everything the same. <laughs> but, you know, LG's not the only one that does this. Everyone does this. Well, I know. Yeah. That's my point is yeah. that it's such... 
well, the video in exactly HDMI that, space is such a disaster do, yeah. that yeah. it's it's really hard to make anything look similar over different devices, which is a big reason why your guys' disc exists exists. But that's the funny thing is because we're four two zero, it should be this the fact that you're losing resolution on a four two zero source is bizarre. Mm, and so yeah. it's their conversion between different places where they're actually introducing the loss. Right. So they're scaling up, scaling down, scaling up, scaling and down. The, the number one place you lose stuff is in Chroma. I, 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 partially because our eyes are less sensitive to Chroma detail than to Luma detail. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a huge bug in Chroma processing and people will not notice it. You know, like if you're not sensitive to Chroma processing issues, it's like I said, you know, the, these programmers, they, they write the algorithm and they test it by popping it up on their test device, you know, maybe a display or whatever in their office. And they're like, it looks good. And you're like, the chroma has been, you know, has been cut in half in resolution and all your chroma is messed up. And it just, it looks, you know, the colors are basically right. People's faces are pink and the grass is green and the sky is blue. And they're like, what is the problem? So I had a I had a bug implementing something. So when you looked at the RGB image, it looked fine. When you looked at the blue channel, there was a double image. I had messed up and I had, it looked like two copies mm -hmm. next to each other, but you couldn't see it when you went to RGB. You can really do bad things to Chroma and never see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I shouldn't say, it wouldn't be a problem if you could never see it. <laughs> the problem is you can occasionally see it and it will eventually drive yeah. you insane. Mm -hmm. Right, and you can't see it. Insane. Yes. Yes. Ignorance my is wife, bliss. Exactly. <laughs> my wife will tell you that we can't enjoy a show for, you know, because I'll be like, <laughs> pause, back, 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 back. What the hell was that? You know, and she's like, <laughs> it's great. Uh, what the hell is wrong? <laughs> yes. What is wrong is that I can't enjoy my show because you're looking at a video artifact. Yes. Right. That's exactly it. Just tell her to go compare her dresses under the natural light again. For <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. So Eric, appreciate the $10 super chat. He says he just pulled the trigger and buying the disc set. Uh, I hope this will not force me to replace my 8K LG TV, but rather improve the picture. Thanks again for brilliant and highly technical content. Appreciate it, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, there were several people that had mentioned they bought the disc. Um, I think even tonight, uh, AA says, nice uh, guest. I bought the disc. I thought there was another one. Yeah, here we go. Easy. Yeah, Ike. Um, he said that, oh, actually, okay, I guess sorry. So you can put Don's up there. We'll read both of them. Uh, okay. I'll hit Ike's after that. He says, Don says, what is the benchmark for color and all your color bars? Pantone, hexachrome, CMYK, hex, RGB. The color bars are pure color. I mean, the color bars go all the way back to SMPTE and original analog video. So the color, the standard color bars are 75% stimulus, which is not linear light 75%, but that's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Solid primary and secondary colors. So it's not a Pantone color, that's for sure. It's not. It'd be an RGB, I could guess. Yeah, it's, it's an RGB value. Mm -hmm. um, and so the red color bar is like, it would be the equivalent of red 75%. So you know 180 or something i think yeah something like 180 that. 60 if you were talking 8 bit 180 in red 16 in green 16 in blue okay yeah um but that's on that's that doesn't translate to computers so if you're thinking about computer color computer color is measured 0 to 255 and mm -hmm. uh digital video is measured in a nominal range of 16 to 235 with some room for excursions above 235 and room for excursions below 16, but you can't, under normal circumstances, see those directly. And that 16 to 235 is an RGB. If you go to YCBCR, which is how it's stored on disk, it's 16 to 235 for Y and 16 to 240 for CB and CR. Dealing with this much with color in your guys' lives, does it change how you view the real world and like seeing color? Do you see it in different values and like Have that color is X, Y, or Z? <laughs> Have you ever seen the movie They Live? You know, yes. you know, where the guy <laughs> puts on the, the guy puts on the glasses. Suddenly they realize that the whole world is filled with aliens and special <laughs> subliminal right, messages. Yeah. That's exactly what it's like. You, you see know, code uh, all day long. <laughs> so right. you, you saw the tulip shot in the montage, right? Yep. The red tulips. Yep. So you should see that in real life. Cause th th that was shot up here at the tulip festival. And when you drive <laughs> over that hill and you see that, that red, like I've never right. seen red like that before mm -hmm. in my life before sealing the tulips. 
I'll yeah. give you an example. I, I start talking about color with people and people will always bring up that they saw something and they took a picture on their phone and it just didn't look the same. And they're mm. really frustrated by that. Sure. And they don't understand, yep. you know, and now we understand, you know, it doesn't help them. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can explain to people in great detail. I mean, eventually they start edging away and they're backing away slowly <laughs> as I'm explaining the color theory and why their phone cannot display this amazing scene. They're like, I had this amazing scene and then there was beautiful tulips or whatever. And I took a picture and the picture just didn't look as good. Wonderful. And people said the same thing when they were taking film. They finally get their film processed and they look at it and they're like, but that was so great. And this picture is kind of blah. And that's because of the limitations of, uh, it's because of the limitations of physical reproduction of color and mm -hmm. understanding why that exists and all the compromises and all the cool things. I mean, it's both cool and frustrating. All these engineers at Kodak, um, a, a lot of both digital video and original film is based on a lot of research done by Kodak. Like Kodak, mm -hmm. in all of color theory comes back to Kodak over right. and over and over again. Those guys were thinking about color for a long time. And it is fascinating how much um, color is this wacky compromise where they're trying to do various things to make the picture that you see on your phone or on your mm -hmm you know, printed film or whatever represents some version that feels like what the original image felt like. Mm -hmm. So all pictures are more saturated than the actual image that you saw in reality, because reality has a wider color gamut than your phone. So to try to give you back okay. some of the vibrance right. Mm -hmm. of reality they goose the saturation because they can they can right. make the colors more saturated they can't make them wider gamut and even if they could make them in gamut there's just something about natural light and the way natural light interacts with mm -hmm. physical objects and bounces into your eye there's a there's a thing that actually in advanced color theory they call mm -hmm. vibrance that can't be reproduced in an mm -hmm. RGB display. You can't, right. it can't be done. So they kind of adjust things to get psychologically speaking, they want that image to look more like what you saw, what your memory of, is of what you saw. Sure. So the net result is that what you see on your phone, you can actually take a picture with your phone and then hold it up to the real scene. And you'll be like, no, the colors are not yeah. the same, you know, well, and that's by design. And it could also be different depending on what country you're in, because there are some countries where they prefer things more blue, some prefer more red. So there will be differences in the image mm -hmm. you, either during playback or capture where they will alter right. it for that purpose. And of course, if you had HDR on your phone, you could get better images. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing is these cameras we shoot in RAW. So you can create it to look like anything you want. Right, and, sure. and the view you're seeing is basically the view that we came up with right when we built the camera we're like okay this is what 709 should look like based on our subjective opinion mm -hmm. so i don't know i mean that's kind of yes and movies aren't <laughs> meant to, to look like reality anyways they use color to tell stories to extract sure. emotion and create a mood and yeah 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 sure. it's it's painting with light you know it's painting with um it's it's not reality and it's the same thing on stage interesting enough my my brother actually he has his degree in uh, theatrical lighting okay and uh he was you know I, I sit down and talk to him about color and light and he's like oh yeah this is exactly what we do in theater lighting is you know you you can change the mood of a scene by just lighting it differently yeah. you know not and sure. it's not immediately apparent to the person watching this the the uh play mm -hmm. but it makes a difference, you know, yeah. it has this emotional content just by changing the color of the light or changing sure. the direction of the light or changing. Same or thing with movies. Mapping. They do mm -hmm. all this stuff, change the tone mapping. They, they do all this stuff that is not directly apparent unless you're in the business or unless you're really sensitive to this kind of stuff or you're just a big enthusiast, but it has this emotional effect. It has this almost subliminal effect that when it all works right, it deepens the emotion of the scene. If the scene is sad, mm -hmm. all this choices they've made with light and shadow and color purpose and, and intentionality. Yeah. It all bolsters and the music and all of these people, I mean, putting together all this work to create one beautiful image or one beautiful scene that is sad or is happy or is 
you know, I whatever. always find it really interesting when you look at, and I've seen some of these before and I don't know what they're actually called, but you see the color grading samples next to the image that they are and they show screenshots of the image and it mm -hmm. all kind of falls into place with your mindset of, oh yeah, that movie is a totally different color, that. but you don't yeah. realize it when you're actually in the film or in the media and ingesting it. But it's when you put all of these films side by side and you see the color mm -hmm. samples, they mm -hmm. look radically different. And so that's remember, as Don is talking about with director and cinematographer's choice to convey a certain message. Right. Remember when the Matrix yeah. first came out on disc, maybe in DVD, everyone complained because parts of it were green. Yeah. Mm. Well, that was intentional. Yep. Right. right. At the time, really? you didn't realize it, but. <laughs> and not even a little bit green. It's really, <laughs> really green. It's really yeah. obvious. Yeah. And by design, yeah. And there's other parts that are like really washed out or have other weird color casts. Yeah. And and yeah, if you're, we, once you're sensitized to that, if you, if, if you, it's kind of like if you're a cinematographer, when you go to yeah. the movies, you're almost seeing a different experience because you're like, oh, wow, they suddenly everything went pink. That's interesting. Right. What are they doing there? You know, if you're just in the story, you don't even notice it, you know, or you, you notice it, but not consciously. Yeah, yeah. Right, sure. Anyway. Sure, just helps tell that story. We got a few more questions here. If we can go through these. Evangelista says, "Hey, uh, how does your disc compare to the Joe and Tell Techno Dad uh, Dolby Atmos calibration disc?" I've never heard of it or seen okay. it. Our, our, you our background, for that? No, no, our background <laughs> is on the video side, so we worked with Dolby and others to help get the audio side done. Sure. So effectively, you're using industry standards for the audio side. Yes. More or less. So Mark Fishman did all the Atmos mixing. Mark mixes movies. Like the last show he worked on was The Last of Us. Mm -hmm. So he mixes gotcha. lots oh, of nice. television and movies. I was so jealous because we talked about that and he saw The Last of Us last year. Yeah. He'd seen it before it even started airing. <laughs> but on the flip side, he saw it before it had any sound. So he's <laughs> saw an inferior version of it. Probably a different right. color grade and didn't look right. I mean, that's just... right. That was different. Yeah. Was it released in Atmos on HBO? Because there, there, there's a another show I met the colorist for. It was um, it was the one with the parallel worlds with J.K. Simmons counterpart, mm -hmm. and that was graded in HDR, but it's never been released in HDR. She also graded the Tick, which she did for Amazon, and mm -hmm. so there's so much that's been graded or either mixed in that most or graded in HDR that yeah. you ne you'll never see that way or won't for a long time. It's kind of sad. This, this is a big thing for me. I'm really into 3D, um, you know, 3D photography and stuff. So I'm constantly, you know, hearing through the grapevine that a particular film, they did a full version of it in 3D and then they don't release it in 3D and it drives me crazy. Right. I've never been a fan of 3D. And, and the biggest reason is being able to put glasses over glasses just doesn't work for me. Mm. It's probably I because should... Don didn't make it. I should say that our Atmos is not me meant to be a, you know, a full Atmos test disc. We mm -hmm. have stuff for setting the levels in the channels. Right. We have stuff for checking base management. And then we have some really cool panning tests. Mm -hmm. And that's our focus. There mm -hmm. are other, other people are probably trying to do a whole lot more with Atmos than we could. Gotcha. Cool. 314 Carpenter, appreciate the $10 super chat. He says, I'm not a calibrator, not an engineer, but still want to make good use of this product. Rolling it back 11 notches for a moment, which disc files are best used by simpletons like me, um, Spears and Munsell for dummies? Well, so would that be is, those first couple of... The actually, video setup menu is the, the one where you really don't need any test equipment. That's the simplest up. one. I think it was... Was it this one? Yeah, and so the included, yep, booklet, yeah, the included booklet that comes with the disc pretty much covers this menu. Except for maybe color space eval. And mm -hmm. and the there's test... Or there's... Um, help text for all of these patterns in this section and the help mm -hmm. text is tries we attempted to write it for somebody who doesn't necessarily have a lot of video knowledge sure um hopefully if you just go through them step by step and read the help text and if you read the booklet there's mm -hmm. also some stuff on our website between all of those things there should be a pretty straightforward step-by-step -step approach to looking at these various patterns and what they're good for so right. that's really the that this one menu worth of stuff is the is the core mm -hmm. for people that just want to make make sure that all their settings are right on their TV. They're using the right color space, right. that everything's set properly, the black level's okay, and so forth. Um, that's what that's for. And what they're referring to is if you hit down on the uh, on your remote, it'll pop up a menu that looks like right here. So yeah. one of our goals was to be able to use any remote in the dark 
without having mm -hmm. to re reposition your hand. Nice. So everything on the disc can be done using the up, down, left, right arrows and the enter button. Sure. Very that nice. was important for us because if, if you're, especially when you're, we used to evaluate different DVD and Blu-ray players. Right. One of them would have gray buttons with green text that you couldn't even read in daylight. Yeah. And they all put the buttons slightly different. So when you're trying to use these, these remotes in the dark, it becomes very difficult. So being yeah. able to, because you can find the enter and the arrow buttons pretty easily. Right. Correct. I, I will say, I will add that if you're enthusiast and you're interested, you should definitely go through the other menus and for the patterns that have help text on them, because mm -hmm. the really advanced stuff, it, it was just impossible to do help text. It's like sure. designed for test equipment and right. very esoteric specific kind of things. Yeah. So for there's a whole section that we just basically said for mm -hmm. these patterns, it's like, if you know, you know, and if you don't know, um, you know, like you need some, very serious video technology books or guides to help you. But for a lot of the patterns, not just in the video setup section, mm -hmm. there is help text and it does explain yeah. what the pattern is for. And certainly going through those patterns and just mm -hmm. reading the help text will hopefully be interesting. You know, that we, I'd certainly encourage people to go through that. They may, in order to use the pattern effectively, you might need test equipment, but by reading okay. that, you can sort of think about, what test equipment might I want? What test equipment should I want a calibrator to have? You know, yeah. what do I, what could I get out of this pattern? And what could I get out of this kind of calibration? Maybe reading through that, you may say, you know what, I'm going to get a colorimeter. I see yeah. what I could do with it. And I know what this could be useful for. And then yeah, that so colorimeter turns into a more col expensive colorimeter and you just open the <laughs> Pandora drive hole. It's just yeah. never ending. Right. So that, that leads really good into Mikey's question here. He says, you know, what hardware does he need to get the most out of these patterns? Like a light meter, spectrometer, colorimeter. Well, the, what, would, what would be the, really useful? The analysis section, which has all your window patterns for doing grayscale, you know, your white balance and uh, CMS, mm -hmm. those all require a colorimeter or a spectroradiometer. Okay. Spectroradiometers are really slow. They're more accurate. Colorimeters are very fast, less accurate, which is often why you use both. One to create the mm -hmm. profile for the colorimeter. Yep. But one of the points I wanted to say real quick was the booklet that's in our disk, that comes with the disk, is actually now on our website to download as a PDF. So okay. if you're thinking about getting the disk and you're on the fence, download Take the booklet look at it. and read it. Yeah. Nice. And then nice. when we were talking about color grading earlier, one of the montages on the disc is a graded versus ungraded version. So it's literally a, a pinwheel it spins. Mm -hmm. And so you can see what the colorist saw when they loaded the footage in Resolve versus what the final product looks like. And so you yeah. can see every shot, how they white balance it or they had to push it. They gained it up to make it brighter and so on or remove the noise from the background. So every shot with the black background, it actually had a noise floor and that was removed mm -hmm. to give you that true black background. So Don mentions, he says, fascinating when you hear everything that goes into producing a good image on the screen. Like, this is some deep stuff. Like I said, this is good conversation. A lot of it's way over my head. It may be over some of your guys in the chat, but, um, you know, it's super fascinating. You're right. Everyone starts someplace, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's up to you to figure out how much you want to learn because it may yeah. not be important to you or it may be super important. Absolutely. And I guess that's one thing that about this disc is there, this disc set is that you can dive as deep as you want into it. If you just need the basics, that's on that home screen. If you want just some audio, that's on the third disc. And then if you want to dive real deep, then there's a bunch of advanced stuff on there as well. And the demo material, you can be confident, is the mm -hmm. best video you're ever going to find on a disc as far mm -hmm. as the the technical aspects of it. As to whether it's interesting or not, that's a whole <laughs> other question. But it, it's <laughs> right. just a montage of interesting mm -hmm. images that each yeah. has a purpose for being there. But yeah. I think it's important to know that this disc is going to, like, as you get more interested and more enthusiastic, if you continue down your AV enthusiasm, the disc mm -hmm. has what you need. Like, we don't know of any pattern that you could put on this disc that we didn't put on the disc. It's got everything. <laughs> so if you buy more equipment, the disc is there. It will right. help you use that equipment. If you want to buy a whole calibration suite or whatever, you know, the disc is has the stuff you need for it. So it's worth sure. pointing out though, that if you get a colorimeter, you usually, you usually need software to control it, mm -hmm. whether it's commercial software like CalMAN or Lightspace, yeah. or whether it's a uh, Chroma pure or something, HDFR, yeah, something exactly. Else. Yeah. So Ike says that he bought the disc, showed up last night. He's looking forward to testing it out. And if anyone has questions about certain patterns on the disc, you can always uh, use our contact form and we'll, we will respond. Cool. Yeah. 
If you have complaints about the disc, you know, just <laughs> send me to that goes to that guy right yeah, down you, there, right? If you love the disc, that's really just because of me. I'm the one that <laughs> holds Stacy, keeps his. Like, it is amazingly true that a lot of the time, you know, Stacy will have an idea for a pattern. And he tells me, and I'm, I basically say, yeah, I don't think that's a good idea. And he'll be like, well, right. what? wait, we could do this. And, you know, and I, I basically convinced him. Sometimes I'll convince him that it really isn't a good idea. And then, like, three days later, I call him and I'm like, I figured out how we could do it. Nice. You know, or vice versa. I mean, I believe it's not it's not always that way. But, you know, it's yeah that's that's the way it often works so stacy will notice how some... great ideas start well yeah. that yeah. pattern you saw earlier with everything on screen <clears throat> i took ms paint and i started mm -hmm. basically cutting up different patterns into pieces and put them all in the same pattern so this is what i want it to look like but prettier sure <laughs> paint in excel <laughs> this is all we need to create a video processing company mm. yeah so we got we got four more questions kind of comments um and then we'll wrap up here in just a few moments and then we'll uh share the winner of the giveaway of the Spears and Munsell new disc set. Uh, Neil Hansen says, cool, thanks for answering my question. I'm getting a deal from a dealer on a Samsung 85-inch uh, Q900B. I'll be picking up this disc. So, again, some people are getting excited about it, so that's great. Yay. Matt says, he has a question. He says, I sent in photos of my previous Spears and Munsell 4K disc to attain a discount on the new version, but never heard anything back. When will that program be put into effect? And I think this is pretty much the same thing. I applied for the upgrade program, didn't hear back. How should I proceed? So who could he get in contact with in regards to that? When does that? Is Jason um, still on? I saw Jason post a comment earlier. Jason okay, is the one Jason that, Rosenfeld. Yeah. Okay. So Jason could look up Matt's info. Assuming okay. he used the upgrade form that's linked off our website. And okay. the upgrade program does end on July 1st. So it ran for three months. Okay. So you've got one more month left to use the upgrade program. Okay. Super cool. So Matt, they'll get you hooked up there. But the answer really is email the, mm -hmm. you know, email the yeah. company and say, hey, I haven't heard back. What's going on? Okay. But if you if you send me use our contact form, send me an email, then I can forward to Jason, and Jason will follow up and find it. Perfect. Appreciate that. So Mig seventy six says, I would buy the media files. I don't have a four K UHD player. I use a PC, NAS, and a Zadoo for all my playback. And I think even in the um, Discord, Jonathan, you mentioned there were some guys mentioning that as well, that if there was a way for them to purchase, maybe not the full three version, but that might be something that you guys could consider having almost like just a digital download, X amount of files for X amount of price. And these guys would, um, you know, like the, the media files that they could have access to that as well. Now, what interesting thing, <clears throat> interesting thing with the new montage is we, we, paid people to compose new music and do the mm -hmm. Atmos mix. Well, that yeah. license is only for disc. So to oh, do it for another format, we've got to pay oh, a new wow. license to get it. See, yeah. there's all the stuff that you guys just think oh, it would be so easy yeah. for them to just drop it in the digital download. And there's yeah. so Well, that's I mean, why that's... if you watch uh, House on streaming services, you'll notice the opening song is different than what was on television because they don't have oh, rights. Wow. Oh, and that man. opening that opening music to oh, me was crazy. a big part of the show. Yeah, yeah that was great. Yeah. It's, so I can't wait to turn up because I was listening to to your that montage you're talking about. I want to crank it up in my theater room because I've so got the, like. There's two pieces of music. The first half is sort of uh, fairly uh, soothing and sensual. It is. It's real relaxing. The second half is electronic. Yeah. And it's a lot more aggressive with the, the height channels, especially. Yeah. Yeah. It's got some nice solid bottom end too. So get my subwoofers cranking on that. Yeah. We I think we had four different mixes of bass levels. We had the mm -hmm. initial mix. And then some people were like, well, that's hardly any bass. So we did a plus three, plus six, and plus nine dB boost mm -hmm. on the subwoofer channel. Yeah. And we gave it to different people. <clears throat> and different people, they were all over the map. Sure. Oh, plus three is way too much. Somebody else is right. like, plus three is hardly anything. So in the end, we used the plus three boost for the LFE. Nice. So okay. I think the overall answer to this whole digital file thing is we're not against it. It's really right. just a matter of like, you know, what format and sure. what devices and how mm -hmm. many people are there who would use that format, you know, to it's, and it's, it's not as simple as just taking the files from the disc. It, it's a right. whole, a whole thing. I wonder yeah. if you could partner with a company like steam or something that releases kind of a copyright protection mechanism that doesn't let people pirate or steal it out. You would, that's not our primary worry. Like yeah. we're, we're not really primarily worried about, about, uh, digital rights management, stuff like that. It's mm -hmm. not, I don't think that's Blu-ray is not exactly a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> Blu-ray, 
Yeah, Blu-ray is a broken format as far as from the <laughs> RM perspective. It's just, it's no, it's really the work just to create files that will work right. And like, mm -hmm. we, you know, we, we know this format well. And of course, yes, you know, as people transition to other formats, we mm -hmm. will look at these other formats. But I think we kind of need stuff to settle yeah. and figure out what is going to be the dominant format. Something about Blu-ray and the UHD Blu-ray. Yes, I know there's people that don't use it, but it is kind of like this one default. There's enough glob mm -hmm. of people that use it that, you know, this that we can sell discs, but mm -hmm. You know how many people would buy it on this format and this format and this format each one represents a lot of work to create a newly encoded version of the disc take, so take dolby vision there's multiple profiles we're using profile seven i think which is blu-ray where it uses a base layer and an enhancement layer then you've got profile eight one and eight three which is basically hdr10 base layer or hlg base layer mm -hmm. and then you've got profile five which is ictcp which is an entirely new color format right new color space and so I think ICTCP is the best, but that's a little redesign of every pattern from scratch mm -hmm, right. that involves color. So uh, Apple TV products seem to only support Profile 5 and 8.3. We can mm -hmm. make 7 and 8.1. So got problems like that. And, and so when you're looking... Solvable, but, you know, yeah. it's work. It's not free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So when you're looking through that menu, it looks like, oh, there's just a image. But behind the scenes, there may be many, many, many renditions of that that image or that series because of what like color space you're using, what uh, device you're using. Is that correct? It, it, that, that's basically correct. Yeah. And, and there, there could be a format out there that would be easier for us to use. I mean, a, a lot of the stuff on the disc is working around quirks of the Blu-ray format of the UHD format that okay. we've laboriously figured out. Right. So to pick a different format, mm. like Kaleidoscape or something, yeah. We'd, yeah, we'd have to do a deep dive <laughs> on that format, right. figure out what are the quirks of that? What's the easiest way to encode this? What can they do? Right. And maybe we could work with them to actually get features that we need so that you know we, we could encode it a totally different way. But it would be a whole process to right. deal with that format and make it optimized for that format. And we just have to make sure that there's enough of a market there that it's worth the time and energy to do it. Like for example, uh, HEVC has a lossless mode. It's mm -hmm. just hardly anything supports it. It would be nice if Kaleidoscape, for example, support lossless, yeah. then it would be so much easier on the encode side. And if they if they supported stills, you know, if they supported stills natively, mm -hmm. and you know, then we could put in, you know, we could put in a pattern as a, you know, as a, uh, a, a single file, you know, sure. and if it was a lossless, right, still format, that would be perfect for test patterns. But mm -hmm. usually, these different formats are not thinking about this. They're thinking right. about how do we get movies and TV shows on there, and those are all in four two zero YCBCR. They're not really thinking about. Could we display something in RGB? Sure. Could we display something in 444 YCBCR uh, uncompressed or losslessly compressed? And could we display a still image? You generally don't need to display a still images except for mm -hmm. test patterns. So. Correct. Right. So definitely some challenges there. So we'll we'll wrap up tonight's discussion. Um, One more question. That's what I mean. Oh. Bro, I'm going there. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> you never know what I'm thinking. And then we'll announce the winner after that as well. So Nick is um, one of our calibrators at M-Wave. It's an event that we do every year, uh, started last year. So this is our second year doing it in July. And so he calibrates all our displays for us. And he's got a great question here. Just started looking at some of the new disc content. Why is the Mac CLL 1643 nit for the 600 nit master luminance and the max CLL 3597 nit for the thousand nit master luminance versions of the long demo video. So the reason is max CLL literally will go through the entire movie and it will look at every single pixel or RGB triplet and it finds the highest value. So when you, you could have one pixel, so you could have an entire movie shot at night where the, where everything is say below 100 nits. But you could have the, the ending credits where you might have a 10,000 nit pixel. And so the max sale would be 10,000. Mm -hmm. That's why it is the way it is. So it's because of some spurious pixel somewhere. And it, that's, that was introduced from the conversion from RGB to 420. All so I hear is Stacy making excuses for a pixel that he missed. No, no, no. I, I, put that, I, put the, I, had, I put those oh, values yeah. in the encoder. I set those Break values him over the coals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, the encoder, I have to input those values. So I run mm -hmm. it through a tool that tells me the max CLL. 
And even though it's a 600 nit version, I put that in the tool to be accurate. I could have hard coded to 600, but I didn't want to. Right. Although I thought it was 1600 for the 1000 nit version. There's a there's a deeper issue here, a deeper answer. Maybe nobody wants to know this, but you know the question is, what is the value of Max CLL? And the answer is, in practice, in the real world, not a lot. I mean, there was a reason that it got put in. But it's a very technical thing. It's literally what is the maximum value I'm going to encounter in this whole thing. But because that's often like a glint, you know, it's a like a really high value like reflection or something on a piece of chrome or something. What is that relevant for tone mapping? It turns out it's not really relevant for tone mapping. In order to do good tone mapping, you really have to either have a hard coded algorithm or a, a specific algorithm like Dolby's, but you really have to evaluate the scene. So max CLL in practice is not that useful. It's a number, it's encoded into the stream, and I, I'm oversimplifying. It's not that mm -hmm. it's not useful at all, it's just that you know, like in practice, you can have max CLL for a stream that really only represents like one pixel. And what's the value in that for tone mapping? Not and, really and some anything. studios will literally go through and actually remove the outliers. I didn't feel like doing that. But mm -hmm. in the RG, in the original RGB master, the 600 was capped at 600. It's that conversion to 420 to YCBCR, where you get these odd pixel values along edges that produce these odd values that cause the spurious, spurious stuff. But I kept it in there because that, that is a real value in there, so I didn't want to change it. Nice. So so I have a follow-up question with that, and it's probably maybe my novice expertise in this area or lack of. Um, that That's not a problem for dynamic tone mapping that's doing like scene by scene or frame by frame. Right. But if you have static tone mapping, it could be an issue, right? Because it changes the, the static tone mapping picture or, or window you relative can, yeah. to what it's going to map. Okay, so just making sure I understood. Some will look at mastering display lumens. Some will look at max CLL and make it conscious decision. In fact, um, I've got a spreadsheet, which we looked at when I was at Spectracal. I think of the first or second gen Samsung, Panasonic, and LG displays. And we basically measured the same patterns at different max CLL levels to see what they did. Well, we set max CLL and mastering display lumens to the same value. Now, all mm -hmm. the test patterns, they are literally hard-coded to the same values. So when you do 600, we set mastering display luminance and CLL to 600. And, mm -hmm. we, and we have an arbitrary value for uh, max fall on all our test patterns. I think it's like 450 or something, completely arbitrary, because mm -hmm. nothing uses it that we've okay. seen. Okay. Yeah, Nick said that he appreciates that. He remembers the 2019 disc, uh, the max CLL yeah. seemed to match the master max luminance, and the 2023 one yeah. has... Uh, spurious values yeah. yeah i thought it was the the 1000 that went up to 1600 but that was in that was all set up about two years ago mm -hmm. so we had the first authoring cut of the disc uh we showed at value electronics in 2021 yeah. and so literally from then until now was just getting it authored so all the content was done pre-2021 or mm -hmm. up until that point yeah i mean this is a problem that the uh, you know, the people implementing tone mapping have had to deal with for a while. Yeah. It's like, in reality, the the Max CLL, different, uh, and different mastering companies will do different things. Some will clamp the value to, some will just run it through a tool and they'll, they'll list whatever comes out. And, you know, if you've got a few like outliers, that just changes the Max CLL, which as you say, could affect the, Mac, the static tone mapping. So they have to fudge things. They have to do various things in there because if they just take the Max CLL and say, great, okay, we're just gonna put it on our tone mapping and we know that it maxes out at this and you know, they can end up with something that looks weird, washed out or whatever. So they end up, they end up putting in a lot of like kludges basically mm -hmm. to make it work right. Yeah, on the and, previous disc, I literally just said, oh, it's 600. I'm going to not even calculate what the max CLL is. I'm just going to set it to 600, which is what I did last time. So this one's technically more accurate. So the previous one had the spurious values. The... Well, it, no, no, it may have had spurious, but I just set it to 600. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I didn't want those values to potentially get clipped this time around. So uh, if you look at our skin tone content, everything is pretty much under 200 nits except for a light ping off the bolt that holds the color checker chart or off one of their earrings. And those go up to about 800 nits. 
yeah, so if you look at the the top of the well, not in this shot, it's usually in the individual shots. Right. But the bolt to the right of that chart holding or the clamp that's holding the chart, mm -hmm. that would the light source hitting it on the right hand side of the frame in the individual shots, it would hit it would be eight hundred nits. Whereas everything else, the back wall and the models, it was all under two hundred nits. Mm -hmm. So in that case, we actually set max we we removed that value out of there. I think we because that actually really impacted Dolby more than anything. Right. Interesting. So you guys are getting discs all night, man. This is great. <laughs> so Matt, I guess Jason was able to get back to him then on the call. That's good. Yeah, See, that's yeah. service. Yeah, wow. He's, he's picking him up, man. <laughs> yeah, he said he got him. He got the, I guess he got the email. He said, uh, Matt just sent you a single use code. So super cool, man. Well, fellas, this has definitely been uh, super educational and very deep for sure. <laughs> And so I know some of you guys are going, man, this was over my head, but we still have tons of people that are just hanging out, enjoying this. Um, so I do want to mention before we let you guys go um, who the winner was. So we did a giveaway for the past week on the channel. And so the giveaway for is for one of your 3D, three disc sets, but also um, the length choice of the LX1 bias lighting. And that winner is Francisco Carrero from Toa Baja, Puerto Rico. So, Francisco, congratulations. I'll send you an email after this podcast and get in touch with you. We'll give you a couple days to respond, so make sure you check your spam on that. And uh, if I don't hear from you in a couple days, then I will redraw a new winner and contact the next person. So, hopefully, uh, you'll get that email. Well, super cool. Fellas, any last thoughts before we wrap it up? No, it's nice to meet you both. Nice Heard your you names for, for years and years. So Absolutely, man. These are the, the, the men, the myth, and the legends themselves. <laughs> but we're grateful for what you do for the, especially the video community. Um, and again, even something that I learned tonight, it, it's not just for guys like me that are the enthusiasts, not for just like guys like Ryan that's uh, an integrator, and the calibrators out there, but it's also for the manufacturers as well, which that's super, super cool to help them make better products for the end user like me and actually all of us here um, on the, the panel as well as in our chat. I would I would just say that we do this for love of, of yeah. films. You know, like yeah. we both love films. We love, you know, video. And uh, that's really what motivated us from the beginning and yeah. continues to motivate us. You know, we're enthusiasts basically, and it's made for enthusiasts. And um, we, we really want it to be better. If you have a suggestion, if you have a thought, Stacy loves to get emails. Let me tell you. He gets it. <laughs> Sorry, um, man. They just, I just forwarded well, he, to Don. So. Yeah, I just forwarded <laughs> him to me. And, yeah. It's in an endless loop. They're forwarded. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm like, what the hell? And I said it back to him. And then he says it to me. And, yeah, you may never get a response, but we read them. We read all of them. Right. <laughs> that's, that's how it works. Honesty and transparency not only extends to the filters right. and the patterns itself, right. but all, also into the email chains and customer support. That's yeah. Funny. But, um, yeah, we, we the hope is that it makes you know, it makes your experience watching movies better. You know, yeah. it's not supposed to be like this it's super technical thing necessarily. I mean, sure. it's as technical as you want it to be. So it's really all about yeah, the movies and the emotion and all these and the and entertainment, enjoyment, yeah. pleasure. For sure. Well, if anybody in the chat or watching on the replay wants to pick up the disc, I've got links to it down in the description. Um, it's a three disc set and uh, comes with the instruction book and the blue glasses that you don't need or the blue filter. It's because there's not four gels. Obviously, if there was four, everybody would. <laughs> but it is an amazing collectible that you should definitely <laughs> say. Hang it up on the wall. Just don't put yes. it in front of your eyes. We will autograph. Well, Stacy will autograph any any blue filters that you want to. Forwarded I mean, from email by Don to Stacy. That's yeah. right. <laughs> for sure and jonathan he's celebrating an 18 year anniversary today i don't know what he's doing on the podcast i would be in the total doghouse so i'm grateful for him and his wife and jessica Maybe he's and I, already in the doghouse he could be <laughs> jessica and i celebrate our 26th anniversary um congratulations on june 7th so we're actually leaving tomorrow no i'm sorry tuesday morning 
heading up to Savannah, Georgia for a couple of days and, and then to the Carolinas. I forget the name of the, the area up there, but I'm going to make about a four day trip out of that. And we'll be back on like Friday. So, well, gentlemen, Don, Stacy, thank you so much. Seriously. It's been a pleasure to so get to know you us. and, and to meet you in person and, and to help you promote, you know, this great product for enthusiasts. And uh, like I said, I'll have links to that disc down in the description if you guys are interested. I hope you guys have an incredible week. Um, next week, next Sunday, we'll have um, just answering home theater questions. So if you've got those, definitely put those in the back of your mind, write a note, and then we'll address those next week. And then if you're coming to M-Wave, we've got lots of folks that are joining us in July. We are only 38 days away. God, so we're super adding pumped. stress to me. Every time I say that, Ryan freaks out even more. So it's kind of fun watching him squirm. No, but it's going to be a great event. It's in Kansas City at the um, Kansas City Convention Center. We just added a, a list of coffee shops, thanks to Chris. He put together that for us. I added that Please. to the website because we're going to need lots of that. Ryan's going to need lots of that. Is there a list of barbecue? Because that there is a list of barbecue. Important. That there was actually the first is. We added. Yep. Chris put that together for us. So if you go to MidwestAVExperience.com and go to attend, there's a section called dining and it's got all the barbecue joints or a lot of them. And so uh, Chris is doing that. And he, he asked me the other day, he's like, can I make one for coffee? I'm like, heck yeah, man. So he's been a great resource. So we're excited about M-Wave. We're excited to be able to hang out with you guys and um, and just have some fun with home theater. We've got some great uh, exhibitors that are going to be there, some great presentations, um, as well as some side-by-side -side comparisons. That'll be a whole lot of fun. So you can check out all the details on the website. So hope you guys have an incredible week. We'll end the podcast here. Again, Don, Stacy, Ryan, Jonathan, Appreciate you guys. Y'all have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks guys. Thank you.